Welcome to r slash am I the jerk, where OP's girlfriend refuses to go to the prom with him. My girlfriend told me no when I asked her to go to the prom with me. We're both 18. Last March, I asked my girlfriend if she wanted to be my prom date, but she told me no and said I should just find somebody else. She told me that I had no initiative because I only asked her after she sent a link which had a photo attached to it that said, will you be my prom date? Fast forward to today. I asked her if she had any partner for the prom and she said no because no one asked her. So I asked her again, but she asked me, did you just invite me because no one else did? And I told her, so you forgot that you rejected me? I then reminded her that I asked her in March, but she rejected me. And here's how the rest of our conversation went. Her, oh yeah. Me, I hope you and the one you'll accept as a partner have fun at the prom, babe. Her, so, you won't go near me during prom? Me. You and your partner should be together, and since I'm not your partner, I should respect you both and leave you two to be. Now she's blaming me, saying that I'm giving her away to another guy. She then told me, You don't want to fight for me and try your luck again and again? Then said, You're fast at giving up. And she told me that we're ending the conversation. I then told her that it's like spinning for the wheel with 0% chance of winning and that I won't fight for someone who doesn't want me or want to be fought for. And now she's silent. What am I supposed to do? Update. She said yes last night after being silent. Told me she was just playing hard to get. Then told me that it was like I was giving her away to someone else. I understood that I wasn't putting enough effort into asking her out, so I decided that I would get her chocolates, which are her favorite, and ask her out in person properly, for the third and last time. So, this is how this morning went. I went to the nearest store and I bought some chocolates. Then I went to school. I found the right time to ask her out in person. I apologized for how I immaturely handled last night. I told her how I'd love to go to the prom with her and she said yes. And no, I did not dump her. I want to understand why she did what she did. And I also understand how I also had a big part as to why she reacted that way, albeit immaturely. Thank you to everyone who's given me advice. I will take it all to heart. I understand that I am too young and immature to be in a relationship. I'm also trying my best to become a better partner and a person. When the time comes where I think that it's too unbearable, for now it's still okay, then I will make my decision and move on. Thank you all. This is immature, and when you look back on this 10 years from now, you're really going to cringe about all of this. Get a different girlfriend. She expects you to fight her over who gets to take her to prom? That's ridiculous. No means no. You deserve a better girlfriend. She's playing head games. You failed the test, my man. She was testing you to see if you were going to be a man and tell her you're taking her to prom. Instead, you showed her how weak you are and said someone else could take her. This happens early on in all relationships and it determines whether or not she will respect you. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or his girlfriend? Please let us know. I know it's been over a decade since I graduated high school, but have times really changed that much that, like, guys are okay with the someone else taking their girlfriend to prom? Am I the jerk if I say no to allowing my husband's daughter to come live with us full time? I've been married to my husband for six years. We have two kids together who are eight and four. Our youngest is special needs. My husband also has a daughter who's 12 from his previous relationship. My husband's ex has had primary custody. My husband gets stepdaughter on weekends and alternating holidays and birthdays. This past weekend, my stepdaughter asked my husband if she can come live with him full time. Her mom recently moved in with her fiancé and his kids, and there's been some friction with that from what I understand. Nothing horrible, just a new house, new rules, having to share a bedroom, etc. My husband didn't give her an answer either way. He said he would look into it. When he and I were discussing it, I had the following objections. Stepdaughter and our kids do not get along. It's something that we've worked on for years, in and out of therapy, and it just won't happen. Stepdaughter resents my kids for existing, and she's cruel towards my youngest. There have been issues with her bullying them. My oldest is very protective of his little brother, and he hates stepdaughter for being so mean to his brother. They've really been getting into it over this. The truth is that most of the time we have stepdaughter, I make arrangements to take the boys to visit their grandparents or husband takes her out of the house for daddy-daughter time to avoid conflict. I can't imagine how living together full-time would be for them. We really don't have room. We have a four-bedroom home. Both my husband and I work from home so we can be caretakers for my youngest. 
Due to the nature of his disabilities, it's really not feasible for him and my oldest to share a room. It wouldn't be safe or fair for my oldest. My stepdaughter's room is used as my work from home office space during the week. I arrange my vacation time and whatnot around her visitation so I can stay out of her space while she's here. I have to take very sensitive phone calls and I need a closed door when I work so common areas are out and my husband uses our bedroom as his home office so that's out too. We don't currently have room in the budget to make an addition to the house or remodel non-livable space at the moment. My husband hears my objections and understands them but he wants to go for it and figures that everything will eventually work out. He doesn't want his daughter to think that he's abandoning her. I feel for her. It would be awful for your dad to say no when you ask if you can live with him. But I have my own kids to think about too, and I just don't believe that her living here is in their best interest at all, considering their history and our living arrangements. Does saying no put me in evil stepmom territory? Edit. For the people who want to make me into a horrible homewrecker to go along with being an evil stepmom, sorry to disappoint, but we did not have an affair. My husband and stepdaughter's mom were never married. They were never in a relationship. They were friends with benefits. They bartended together, would shoot the bull, and would sometimes drink and hook up. My husband claims that he needed beer goggles because she really isn't his type. When my stepdaughter's mom found out she was pregnant, she told my husband she was keeping it and asked if he wanted to be in the baby's life. They never lived together except for a few weeks during the newborn stage to help out. Yes, I had my first before I married my husband. My husband and I were in a long-term relationship. My husband and I discussed what we wanted to do and we decided that we wanted to raise the kid. A few days later, my husband proposed. I wanted to take time to recover from birth and wait until our kiddo was old enough to pawn him off on the grandparents for the week so husband and I could enjoy our wedding. We didn't get married until my oldest was two. Honestly, I don't really know how to rule on this. Ultimately, I just feel bad for kids in her position. Obviously, no excuse for the bullying. Kids whose parents get divorced and start new families and suddenly they have no place and they're no one's priority. Have quite a few friends who are in that position and it just sucks. I would go for a middle route. Sit stepdaughter down and explain to her that the way she treats your kids has been unacceptable for a long time and you refuse to let her live there if she's going to keep bullying them. Tell her that if she can change her behavior and treat her step-siblings with respect and kindness, you'll be willing to revisit the subject after she stays consistent for a year. I think that if you and your husband make it clear that her behavior towards the other kids is a problem, she'll understand. She also might just suck it up and deal with it at her mom's. But she needs to understand that her treatment of your kids is going to continue to be a problem if she doesn't choose to change. This is the humane and sane solution. Don't let dad walk away from stepdaughter, who should always have a place in his home, and ensure the other kids are emotionally and physically safe, which they have to be. Giving a 12-year-old that no one seems to want some efficacy and control over her living situation should help her either change her behavior or cope with her current situation. Everyone sucks here. And by everyone, I mean the adults. None of the kids are to blame for your failures. This is supposedly something you've worked on in and out of therapy for years. So you feel justified just giving up on your kids and their half-sister ever getting along? Really? If your kids were grown adults on their own, I might give you a pass for that but the oldest here is 12. On top of her being 12, she was only four when your first son was born, and you and her father wouldn't marry for another two years after. Even if you weren't her father's affair partner, given how close her parents' split had already been, it certainly looks that way, and it's likely that her mother framed it that way. So yeah, at 12, her resentment is a little understandable. Likewise, your older son's resentment is understandable. However, none of that excuses you and your husband giving up on her. While his attitude of it will just work out is grossly irresponsible, he isn't wrong about how refusing will mean abandoning her. You don't get to just give up on your kid because things are difficult. Moreover, given that you chose to have kids with a man who already had a kid, you also don't get to just make him give up on her because it would be harder for you and your kids. She was there first and didn't choose any of this. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk for not letting stepdaughter move in with them or not? Please let us know. A lawyer's pro-revenge on a landlord. Landlords are jerks, generally speaking. Everyone knows that. But if you think residential landlords are bad, they're nothing compared to commercial landlords. Landlords of commercial buildings are some of the cruelest, nastiest people I've ever come across. This revenge tale is about a commercial landlord and how I dealt with them. Back in the 90s, sometimes I'd go for lunch at this restaurant in the basement of our building. The place was called The Vault, 
because it had a massive bank vault that had always been there, dating back to the days before the place was turned into a restaurant. The vault was so huge that they could seat a couple of tables in there, and you could eat dinner surrounded by rows of old, gleaming safe deposit boxes. One day I was there for lunch, and the owner took me aside. The landlord's driving me nuts, he said. The landlord drives everyone nuts. I was a subtenant in the same building, sharing space with an older lawyer, Aaron, and the landlord was always causing us trouble. I had already had a few run-ins with him, and we hated each other on site. In most jurisdictions, commercial landlords don't need court orders to get you out. Instead, they just change the locks, and you'll find out about it when you show up and your key doesn't work. Every time our landlord had a dispute with anyone, which was often, he'd always threaten to change the locks. He keeps demanding all this stuff for extra rent, and it's really weird because a lot of it is really old. The restaurant owner showed me a letter the landlord had served him earlier that day. I looked over the demand and read a list of expenses and snow removal and parking lot repair and common area flooring, all kinds of crap going back years. I read it all the way to the end and there it was, the usual clause saying he was going to change the locks if the tenant didn't pay this and do that. From the wording of the demand, it looks like you've been fighting for a while. Why did you wait before consulting a lawyer? I asked one of the lawyers I know and he said that it's hopeless. He told me the lawyer's name. It was a guy I knew with a crappy real estate practice who'd resorted to taking little legal aid cases to keep the lights on when the market tanked in 89. Did you do something to make the landlord hate you? I asked, because this is a bit over the top, even for our crappy landlord. He knows I'm moving the restaurant. I think he's trying to grab as much money as possible before I go. Plus, he's giving me grief over the vault. He won't let you take it with you? Are you kidding? It weighs almost 100 tons, and I don't need it but the lease says I have to remove it and that I also have to restore the building to what it was before there was a vault. That would cost a fortune. The jerk landlord says if I leave the vault behind when I move, he'll sue. Me. Send your lease up to my office and let me look it over, I said. I finished my lunch and when I got back to the office, the lease was waiting for me. It was just as bad as the restaurant owner said. The lease was a renewal of a renewal of an assignment of a renewal. The original documents dating back to shortly after World War II, when a bank first leased the place and the vault was installed. Somehow, the landlord had suckered the restaurant into taking over a lease that left him liable to remove a bank vault at the end of the term. No big deal, I thought. The restaurant can default, and all the landlord can do is sue a shell company. But when I got to the last page of the lease, there was a guarantee clause. The restaurant owner had personally guaranteed the lease, and he was on the hook for removing a vault weighing a hundred tons and then fixing the place up. It would cost a fortune. The case was hopeless, of course. That was obvious right away. But then I thought about the crappy landlord with his demands and his threats and his rent hikes, and I asked my brain to do me a solid, which it promptly did. I picked up the phone and called the restaurant owner. I'm done for, right? You're calling me to tell me there's no way out. That's what my commercial lawyer already said, but I just thought I'd ask. Me. I can save you, but it's gonna cost. How much? 5000 in legal and another G note for the agent. Agent? What kind of agent? Real estate. Send me a check, certified, and leave the rest to me. The check hit my desk in less than an hour. I went to Aaron's office. I need a real estate agent, I said. You buying a house? Nope. Selling a house? Nope. By this point, I'd been sharing space with Aaron for almost five years, and he knew me pretty well. You pulling one of your stunts again? He asked. Yep, but nothing that will get you into trouble. I know a guy. Aaron knew all kinds of guys, and that's one of the reasons he eventually got disbarred. But he knew a guy, and he gave me the agent's name and number, and the next day, I paid the agent a visit. I told him what I needed, and we agreed to terms. I gave him some papers and the cash for his fee. A few days later, I was again at the vault for lunch. The owner saw me walk in and greeted himself. The landlord's here, he said. Why? For lunch, and to be a jerk. Let's sit in the vault room so I don't have to look at his face. He took me to the vault room, and with the door almost completely closed, we had a consultation while we ate pasta and drank red wine. We're making demand on the landlord, I said, munching on my spaghetti. Demand? What are we demanding? I pulled a document out of my briefcase, and I passed it to him while I sipped my wine. We're demanding that the jerk landlord release all the restaurant equipment, all the fixtures, the ovens, the freezers, the ventilation, 
everything you need to run a restaurant. The lease exempts all that stuff. He can't stop me from taking what I want. The only thing that matters is the vault, and of course I don't want that. I shook my head. You need the vault, I said, and we're demanding that he release the bank vault as well. We're insisting that he let you take it out within seven business days. You think you can beat the landlord with reverse psychology? You think if you treat him like a two-year-old, you can manipulate him into doing what you want? We'll find out soon enough. He's had the demand for a couple of days now. The restaurant owner dropped his wine glass and it shattered on the marble floor. You already gave it to him? The restaurant owner said. He got up, swung open the vault door, and called for the waiter to clean up the mess. Let's see what the landlord has to say, I told him, and we walked over to the landlord's table. The landlord was a big, beefy man with a big appetite. He sat alone, eating wolfishly and with his hands. My client needs an answer today, I said. The landlord looked up at me as he chewed noisily. I'm the vault's lawyer, I said. I gave you a demand the other day. My client needs an answer right now. He needs the vault for a new place, and he's got to make arrangements. Your client can forget about the bank vault, he said, wiping his massive, greasy hands on an already soiled napkin. But you can't do that, I said. My shock was feigned, but the restaurant owner's jaw dropped for real. The landlord laughed at us. I'm the landlord. I can do what I want. I'm going to need that in writing, because my client might sue, I said. Sue all you like, the landlord told me. Sue till you're blue in the face. He told me that I'd have a formal response by day's end, and then he told me to go away and let him finish his lunch. When the letter arrived from the landlord, claiming ownership over the bank vault, I brought it downstairs and showed it to my client. How the heck did you do that? Trade secret, I said. The following month, the restaurant moved out and the place was empty, and that was too bad because I had always liked eating at the vault. Now the restaurant was in a new location 20 minutes away. They called the new place The Vault, and they'd preserved the vibe of the old place. It was very similar, except they didn't have their bank vault. The bank vault, all 100 tons of it, was where it had always been, in the basement of the building where I rented space. I showed up for work a little after that, and Aaron collared me. The landlord's looking for you, he said. Oh yeah? About what? He's really angry. He said his deal fell through. Deal? He was supposed to rent the place downstairs to a new tenant, a bank or a credit union or something like that. They were supposed to come in to sign the lease, but they didn't show up. And what's that got to do with me? I said to Aaron. And I said the same thing again to the landlord when he managed to track me down a couple of days later. I know you were behind this. I know it was you. The offer from the agent, it was all BS. Just a trick to make me keep the vault so that your client could sneak out of the place and leave that bank vault behind. I'm gonna sue. If you're looking for counsel, I think I'm going to have to declare a conflict. I'm going to sue the restaurant and that agent, and I'm going to sue you. He stormed off. But the landlord didn't sue. Of course he didn't. He didn't have a contract to sue on, only a vague letter of intent that I had drafted, enough to hook a greedy landlord who was used to having his way. The offer he had received was non-binding and capable of acceptance without the signing of a formal lease, which of course never got signed. When I left Aaron's place a year later, the downstairs was still unoccupied, with a sad, for rent sign sitting in the window, starting to look faded. Am I the jerk for telling my pregnant 19-year-old daughter she needs to move out ASAP? My daughter, Rose, who's 19, was always a smart girl. She did well in school and got a full ride to a great school that's local. She's been living with me and going to school and she's doing well. She got this new boyfriend a few months ago who I don't like. I can smell the BS. He constantly lets her down, but covers it up with a big smile and grand promises. Despite my warnings, they're still dating, and now she's pregnant. I offered to pay to get rid of it and take a few days off work to help her recover. She said no. She's going to marry her boyfriend, and they'll be one big happy family. He wants to move into my house, and she'll drop out of school while he works to support them. He's a bartender who doesn't go to college. I laughed at this idea, which made her mad. She told me that since he can't move in, I'll need to step up and help with the baby more. Y'all, she has always been a very sensible kid. I don't know where this all came from. I flat out told her that if she thinks she's grown enough to have and raise a kid and get married, then she needs to move out soon and manage being an adult with the father. I raised the one kid I wanted to. I do not want any more kids living in my home. I told her I'd pay for diapers here and there and I'd still visit her 
but this baby is 0% my responsibility. If she chooses adoption, which I'm pretty sure she wouldn't, I'd be willing to help her navigate that. She won't talk to me. My husband, her stepdad, is staying out of this, but thinks I could help more. I told him he's welcome to go over and babysit for her, and that shut him up. Am I the jerk? Edit. I had my daughter when I was 19. I was married to her father who was in the military. I still graduated college on time at the age of 22 and everything worked out well for us until he passed in the service. The fact that it worked out okay for me is clouding my daughter's judgment, I think. Her trashy boyfriend can't even offer her or her kid health insurance. It's a completely different scenario. Also, so many of you are suggesting that I still let her live with me and keep the baby. That's not happening. I do not want a baby in my home, period. And I'm not babysitting either. I'll do normal grandparent stuff like show up to birthday parties and buy gifts here and there, but that's it. Let her know how much car insurance is going to be if she's not under your policy. That number alone was enough to make my son stay in our home and save up his money before he moved out. I have a friend who was in the same situation with her daughter about 16 years ago. They let her stay but told her it was the one and only time and they set all sorts of parameters. Now, 16 years later, that same daughter and her now five kids still live with them. They've put them out several times to try and make it on their own, but it breaks their hearts to see their kids not be taken care of. The kids always beg to come back. It's an awful situation. Not the jerk. If she's doing grown-up things and making grown-up decisions, she needs to learn how to be an adult. She wants live-in childcare and complete financial support from you for her kid and her husband. They want a free ride with no responsibility to themselves or their kid. They'll never move out if you allow this. Am I the jerk for not respecting my roommate's curfew? I'm in a fight with my roommate and my friend suggested that I get additional opinions on here. Some background. I'm a freshman in college living in a dorm and got a randomly assigned roommate. We live very different lifestyles. I like to stay up late and sleep in late and she likes to go to bed early and wake up early. At the beginning of the year, she told me she likes to go to bed early and she's a light sleeper, and I told her I like to stay up late, and we made an agreement that she could turn out the light at any point and I would be quiet after that. She goes to bed at like 9 to 11, and I often get ready for bed and lay in bed at these times out of respect. However, there are generally two to three nights a week, one of which is a weekday, that I stay up late and out past this time. I keep the light off and do nothing more than crawl into bed when I return home, around midnight to 3 a.m. About three weeks ago, my roommate told me she doesn't like me staying out late because it affects her sleep and that she wants me back by midnight. My friends have made fun of me since because out of respect for her, I have, except for a few exceptions, left parties, study sessions, and hangouts early to get home on time. On Monday night, I was out playing board games with friends and I lost track of time. I noticed it was 12.30 and out of respect for her, I decided to pull an all-nighter with my friends in the common room. I returned that morning at 8.15 to get ready and shower because I had a meeting at 9. However, I got an angry text later that day, calling me out for returning at 8.15 despite me doing my best to remain quiet and even not returning home at an unreasonable hour, as I would have been up at that time anyway. I responded and apologized for waking her up, but explained that I stayed out all night for her and I did nothing wrong. I also explained that while I was willing to compromise and be back most nights at midnight, as long as I was courteous, there would be nights that I would come back later. I got a message last night that she had scheduled a meeting with our RA to mediate, and I honestly want to know if I'm in the wrong, if she's in the wrong, or if it's just a bad situation. Any advice would be welcome. Thanks. Did you guys fill out a sheet about roommate assignments and what you're looking for? We did fill out a roommate assignment sheet, and I put that I like to stay up late. However, they must not have prioritized it. Why did OP post here? My friends in the past have expressed that they believe she's trying to control me and that I should be able to stay out as late as I want. However, my friends all like to stay out like me and I wanted to get some diverse opinions because I understand where my roommate is coming from. Edit. Thank you to everyone who responded. It really gave me a reality check and the confidence to stand up for myself. In general, my roommate is a very nice person and besides a few minor other issues, we get along well. But I do recognize now that her requests are unreasonable. Next week is my spring break, and we've scheduled the meeting for the following week, so I will provide an update then. To those of you who suggested a room change, I would be fine if my roommate changed rooms. However, it would be difficult for me to move. I have a minor disability, which would pose challenges to moving my stuff, and my family lives in a different state. 
so while they would help, I don't want to ask that of them, especially since the school year is almost over. Update. I met with my roommate and the RA today. He told her that she couldn't set a time for me to return, but had us set specific expectations for when I return home late, like no opening and closing drawers, turning on lights, and closing the door gently. Things I was already doing, but I will be extra mindful of in the future. I told her that I appreciated her as a roommate and felt bad about how my different lifestyle affected her and would be mindful of coming back in, but like the RA said, I would be coming back on my own timeline. I appreciate the support. Karen demands to meet at my house. So, a couple of years ago, I was selling an iPad mini. To avoid possible theft at my parents' house, I would ask the buyer to meet at a neutral location. Reasonable, right? Not to this, Karen. Here's how the conversation went. Karen. Hi, is the iPad still available? Me. Yes, $50 is the lowest I'm willing to take as I'm putting it towards a new tablet. I prefer Samsung Electronics over Apple. Karen. Okay. Where do I get it? Now, I live in a small town, and the largest gas station has a small eating area where you can enjoy your food without going outside in the winter. I figured I would meet her there, then get a sub at the subway in there. Me. Can you meet me at the gas station? Silence. I figured she was looking for the address as she was from out of town. Two days later, Karen messaged me again. Karen. So, my husband says that you stole it, and you are trying to get us arrested. It is weird that you want to meet us at a gas station. His mom used to be a police officer. I don't want to buy stolen merchandise. Me. I didn't steal it. I got it in college with a massive $1,600 media kit. If you didn't steal it, why can't I come get it from your house? Me. One, it isn't my house. It belongs to my parents. Two, even if it is my house, I'm not giving you my address. If your husband's mom was really a cop, he would know about the dangers of selling online. Karen was mad. She said it was my house or she's not buying. She stopped messaging me. It's not the end of the story. A week later, Karen messages me again. I changed my mind. I want the iPad. Me, lying. Sorry, I sold it. What? Why? You know I wanted it. Me, you said you didn't want it. You suspect I stole it because I wanted to meet at a neutral location. I'm sorry, but I wasn't going to hold it. You are an awful person. I hope someone comes and steals your new tablet. She blocked me after that. Thankfully, not too long after, a nice woman who understood why I didn't want people to know where I lived. She gave me $70 for the iPad, and I put that money aside for my Samsung. Have you ever sold something to someone online? If so, how did it go? Please let us know. Mm, Facebook Marketplace all day, bruh. Help! My boyfriend plays too much video games. So, I'm a 30-year-old female, and my boyfriend, who's 39, plays Heroes of the Storm a lot. He doesn't work, so it's not unusual for him to play 12 hours a day. Now, of course, I don't mind him playing video games, but it's the intensity that annoys me. One game lasts about half an hour, and he cannot get off the computer mid-game. Then he starts a new game immediately after. I hate that I have to do every little thing around the house while he plays. When coffee is ready, I'll bring him a cup too. Food delivery guy is at the door, so I'll get the food and take out the plates, etc. His phone is ringing and he asks me to answer. Food is nearly done, so I'll check on it every few minutes and make sure it doesn't overcook while he plays his game without a care in the world. I know these things are small and I feel stupid even complaining about this, but there's many situations like this a day and it makes me feel like I'm his personal assistant. That sucks, especially because I'm working and bringing in the money, so I feel like he should be doing a lot more than he's doing now. I tried talking to him about this, but he felt like I'm attacking him over something stupid. Today, I kinda snapped. I was working from home and I still took care of these little things. I made us coffee and brought him a cup. Later, I made us some lunch and washed some dishes so we could eat. All I asked him to do was to take the food off the stove because I was on the phone with my coworker, but he couldn't because he was playing his game. I decided that I won't be doing him favors anymore. I'm gonna make my coffee only for me and he can make his own. When food arrives, he can get his own plate and I won't wait for him. I told him this, but he thinks I'm being ridiculous because the things I do are so small. He said that it literally takes me zero effort to make coffee for him too. I know he's right, but I told him it was a principle. It's not fair that he doesn't do me any favors even when I'm working. I mean, he probably would, 
but he can because his game is literally always on. He reminded me that he does half the bigger chores and we always go to the grocery store together. I admitted that he's right about that too. Well, he doesn't do half, but whatever. He told me that it'd be stupid to skip a 30 minute game just to get up for 30 seconds to get the door or get coffee or whatever. I understand him, but I tried to explain that every little thing shouldn't be my responsibility just because his game is unpausable and lasts 30 minutes every time he starts one. He called me childish and mean and that I was only trying to prove a point. Well, I might be childish, but am I the jerk? Update. I have to add, normally he's the most wonderful guy. He's gotten slightly depressed because he basically lost his job due to what's going on. He organizes events, and I think that makes him like this. Normally he doesn't play that much, and normally he makes more money than I do. I hope this is only temporary. Well, what would you do if you were in this situation? Would you keep doing everything on your own, or try to get your significant other to help out? Please let us know. I'd throw that game out is what I'd do. Don't play with me, boy. Am I the jerk for making my Tinder date cry? I, 28 male, met a sweet girl, 25 female, on Tinder. We were pretty much into each other, and I gotta say, she was different from any other girls I've dated throughout the years. We talked, sent each other pictures, but never met in person. That was because every time I asked her out, she'd say she wasn't ready. Until last week. She rang me and said she would like to go out for a nice dinner, and asked if I was still interested. I said yeah, I would absolutely love to. We set up a date. We decided to meet at a family restaurant that she knows too well and often frequents. Unfortunately, the place was packed. I don't like crowded places. I do not ever eat at crowded places, but I tried to suck it up and be nice. We sat and started talking. She told me that she was a widow. She lost her husband a year ago. I was in shock. She never mentioned this to me before. I thought that wouldn't bother me. That is, until she told me that she didn't find me on Tinder randomly. She chose me when she saw my pic and read my profile. I felt flattered, but she said that I looked pretty much like her husband, except that I was shorter, way shorter than him. Obviously, I disappointed her. She said they met the exact same way, different dating site, and talked about their first date. I was already feeling uncomfortable, but then she started tearing up. Her tone got loud, people noticed and started staring at us thinking I was being a jerk and making her cry. I got all sorts of nasty looks, especially from the ladies in the restaurant, and the look on my face wasn't helping. The waitress noticed and asked my date if she was okay. I tried to calm the situation down. My date excused herself to the bathroom because her mascara got ruined. A guy walked up to me, told me he was from this area and knew my date, then asked if there was an issue because she was crying. I just sat there like an idiot while he was implying that I better not be causing trouble. I so wanted to leave while she was in the bathroom. She got back, looking all cheered up, then she started talking about her late husband again. 30 minutes later, while I was about to leave, I asked if she needed me to call an Uber, and she asked me to do it. I called her an Uber, then left shortly after her. She texted me and asked if I was upset because of what she did. I said it was okay, she said she wants to go out again soon, but I'm not too sure about that anymore. Trick me out of my laptop? You'll give me your car. 13 years ago, I was in my late teens, living on my own and really struggling to live financially. One of the few possessions I had was an old laptop. My laptop had stopped working properly, and while I'm fairly proficient in using a computer, I had no idea about fixing them. I did a bit of searching on the internet, but couldn't get it working, so I asked my stepdad to take a look. He has a quick look and says it's messed up, but he'll take it off my hands if I don't want it, so I said sure. If it's broken, then it's no good to me. 10 minutes later, I walk in the room and he's using it. I asked if he fixed it and he says, yeah, thanks for the laptop. I was obviously upset. My mom says she wasn't getting involved and his only response was that he did a quick internet search to find the fix and I could have done the same. I was broke and he took one of my only possessions, even though he had a PC and a laptop already. A few months later, I was visiting my mom and stepdad when I had an idea. While I am useless with computers, I'm very competent with mechanics, specifically Audis, and my stepdad had a 2001 Audi A3. Before coming in the house, I went under his car and unplugged the oil level sensor and a vac line for the turbo. Later on that day, he went to go to the shop or something. When he started the car, it threw up oil warning lights on the dash and wouldn't boost, so he turned it off and had a look of concern on his face. I went out to ask him what's up and he said that something gone majorly wrong. 
He says something along the lines of catastrophic turbo failure or engine failure. He's already spent quite a bit on repairs and didn't want to spend any more money on it, so spoke to my mom about just cutting his losses and scrapping it. I asked how much it's worth at the scrapyard and he says 100 pounds, so I ever so graciously offer 120 pounds to take it off his hands to maybe part it out, which he accepts. He signed over the logbook, title, and wrote me a receipt of purchase and handed the keys over. I walked outside, lifted the bonnet, pretended to look at my iPhone for a minute, went under the car and plugged the vac lines and oil sensor back in, fired it straight up and drove around the block. When I got back, I gave him the thumbs up and said it's all fine now. His mouth was wide open and he was mega upset. And my reply was, you could have found the solution too with a quick internet search. He tried arguing that it wasn't fair and if it's working, then I can't just take his car. But I just said he didn't have a problem tricking me out of my laptop and that he's already signed the car over to me, so tough luck. My mom kind of laughed and said she's not getting involved and that it was his own fault. I still have the car to this day and it's practically in showroom condition and runs sweet. Edit. Guys and gals, it's not that unbelievable. I tricked someone into thinking their car was broken so I could have it. Yes, it's 100% true. Yes, I know I'm a jerk and I don't deny that it was a jerk move, but I thought people might get a kick out of a bit of revenge. Speaking of cars, what's your favorite car of all time? Please let us know. I'm a Mercedes girl myself. Mm, yes. Am I the jerk for dividing our family over an ultrasound? I, 32 female, and husband Frank, 34 male, were pregnant. Everyone on both sides of the family seemed super excited about the baby because it was the first grandchild on both sides. My parents ended up being in town coincidentally the day I had a scheduled ultrasound, so I invited them to tag along and see. Cue lots of happy tears. My in-laws never outright protested, but there were jealousy noises, so I decided to invite them to my next scheduled ultrasound. Mother-in-law and father-in-law live a fair distance away, so we planned a weekend around the scan. My sister-in-law has always been a bit tricky. She's four years younger than Frank and the baby of the family. No is not in her vocabulary. She has shown little to no interest in me or the pregnancy. I'm not offended by people not liking babies, no big deal. But I start getting tired of her calling our unborn kid things like goblin and fruit. Sister-in-law and I don't hang out or talk by the way. She just posts sarcastic comments in the family chat. I just ignore her or let Frank handle it because life is too short for whatever this attention-seeking slash jealousy slash nonsense is. Fast forward to my picking my in-laws up at the airport Thursday night and surprise surprise, my sister-in-law is there too. We're a bit confused since she's never flown out to see us in six years of marriage and she wasn't invited, but yeah, she's showing an interest, so we go along. We go to dinner and after we're talking about the scan, sister-in-law pipes up about how it better not be early in the morning because she's not forcing herself to miss sleep over my spawn. I laugh and tell her that the scan is scheduled for 7.15 a.m. and we'll be back in time for breakfast before she's even up. Sister-in-law loses it and starts screaming at me. Frank and I explain that there can be three people plus me in the room, him, father-in-law, and mother-in-law. Mother-in-law says Frank should be the one in the waiting room because she's our guest. I start getting annoyed because A, it's my ultrasound, B, it's his baby, C, she wasn't invited. I tell sister-in-law she's not coming and all heck breaks loose, screaming at me, calling me names, etc. In-laws back up sister-in-law and say that if she's excluded, they're not coming to the appointment either giant family fight ending in Frank kicking his whole family out of the house and we go to the ultrasound by ourselves. Baby is now 10 months and in-laws still haven't met him. Sister-in-law hasn't spoken to us and blocked us on everything. Father-in-law and mother-in-law constantly harp on the fact if I had just let sister-in-law come to my scan, I wouldn't have divided the family and ruined everything this way and they won't meet our son until we apologize and that I'm cruel for keeping him from his family. I think I should get a say in who I want at my own medical appointments, but it's been going on for over a year now, and they're still refusing to acknowledge the baby. Am I the jerk for not letting her come? Was it worth all of this sadness and drama for a 45-minute scan? Am I the jerk for depriving my son out of an entire half of his family because I wanted a say in my own pregnancy? Edit. Sorry guys, I'm new at this and forgot to mention the reason I think I might be the jerk. Yes, my sister-in-law is a brat 
And yes, my in-laws are exhausting. And yes, I'm probably going to need another teeth grinding night guard when I chomp through mine like a beaver. But he's a pretty cool little guy and is starting to learn words and recognize people and has a great relationship with my family. I'm anxious that no apology will be given on either side and now it'll be six years down the road and I'll have to answer to him. Oh, why don't you have a relationship with daddy's family? Well, mom decided her hill to die on was a black and white video of you because she didn't want your aunt dictating her body or choices. Like, I get that I was in the right to have her not in my appointment, but should I swallow my pride enough to fix things that my little guy gets half his family back? Or stick to my guns because the whole family is family thing doesn't hold water if everyone is toxic drama. Edit 2 Yes, as those Redditors who have had babies before guessed, the ultrasound I'm referring to is the big 20-week anatomy and gender reveal ultrasound. So yes, my in-laws were saying they should all be in the room while my husband stood in the hall as we found out the baby's gender for the first time. To answer more questions, we're dealing with a family of Long Islanders here, so that should clear up most family dynamic questions. To the non-Americans in the post, Long Island is in New York and is characterized by loud, pushy, affluent, dramatic women. Sorry to everyone who's getting lumped in here. So in general, that means my sister-in-law is spoiled, rich, and the family princess. She has no mental or physical problems, has no known fertility issues, never been married, and is just all around rather difficult to deal with due to some serious entitlement issues. Sister-in-law dislikes me because her brother and I are vaguely apathetic to her. I'm not impressed by purses or horses or jewelry, so I just nod bemusedly as she shows me her newest Arabic tack or Von Cleef swatch watch. I collect cake pans, so she finds my lack of social standing beneath her and that my husband is an embarrassment since he went into something so pedestrian as crypto. Since we don't need the family money, we try to stay out of family drama as much as possible since we embarrass her. Who knew buying jeans at Target was such an unpardonable offense? We try to just keep out of it, so the ensuing fight at our house was one for the ages. 30 years of family drama got brought up, missing my husband's debate championship for sister-in-law's writing schedule, father-in-law and mother-in-law always allowing sister-in-law to choose first at activities, vacations, theater tickets, etc. Frank seems to have found it heartbreaking if cathartic to finally let it all out. Now that everyone has clearly convinced me to wash my hands of my lingering guilt, I shall swift shake all this crap off and follow Frank's lead. The world is stressful enough without what these lovely people add to it. I won't stop if they choose to form a relationship with a baby, but it'll be on my husband's terms. You all were right and that I felt like I had to fix it because I felt like I broke it. When I was really only the tipping point, it fell off from. To the super kind-hearted people saying I can't be this innocuous and must be leaving something out? Wow, I wish I was. This would be far more palatable for me if I could pinpoint doing something that I could point to and be like, that tracks, I guess, I deserve that. I wish I was more interesting or dramatic, but I am incredibly boring. I'm basically Anne from Arrested Development personality-wise. I'm going to put this beep to bed, drink a big old glass of red wine, and listen to Don't Rock the Boat because of all of the wonderful tipsy boat analogies. Thanks again, everyone. Cheers from our little family to yours. Lady couldn't eat the fish because it was touching the other meat. Didn't mention it to us. Been a while since I've had a customer complain over the phone since all of this happened. I was hoping to get some peace, then lo and behold, I get this call. It's not verbatim, but it captures the heart of the conflict. Some background info. Our restaurant is one of those make your own bowl slash plate slash meal type of establishments. You basically choose a base, add meats, vegetables, and sauces, etc. Obviously, in our menus, we write dietary notes like, this contains pork, or contains soy, and most importantly, please tell us if you have any dietary restrictions or allergies. Customer calls to complain about her online order. Me. Hello, restaurant speaking, how may I help you? Customer. Yeah, I ordered from your restaurant, and you mixed the fish with the chicken. I can't eat it. Me. May I ask under what name? Customer. It's under the name John Doe. Me. I'm sorry to hear that. I'm looking at your order and it's with the chicken. There was no instructions to separate it in its own container. Customer. Well, I can't eat it. Why would you put fish and chicken together? Me. Well, in this restaurant we have customers who add and mix their meals. Some add pork, chicken, and shrimp. Others have tofu and sausages and other combinations. We'll put it in with their base bowl unless they specifically tell us to separate some things. Customer goes on a rant about how abnormal my restaurant is. 
How is that normal? Who does that in a restaurant? Me. Chipotle, Qdoba, Bear Burger, Indikitch, Chard, every Poke Bowl restaurant, a bunch of ramen restaurants, Kava, a bunch of delis, and even some halal carts with their chicken and lamb over rice combo. This isn't how you serve food to your customers. Internal me. No, this is how we serve our food. Our customers have enough common sense to ask to not have foods they can't eat mixed in or at least separated. Customer. I am never coming back to this restaurant, ever. Me. I'm sorry to hear that. She hangs up. Me. Yo, manager, just a heads up if you get a complaint on Yelp or an email about an order about not separating stuff. Here's the copy of the order. Manager. So, she didn't write to separate it? Didn't mention she can't eat the stuff? All right. We got evidence just in case the office branch calls about it. Following day, John Doe orders online again, and this time with no fish. Karen thinks my mother-in-law works as a secretary. Cast. We've got my mother-in-law. We've got Karen, mean lady who I'm unsure if she's really named Karen, but she looks like one. We've got me, and we've got the secretary, really nice lady who actually does work there. Story. So I was into physio before all of this started and I have a mother-in-law drive me. But we also had to bring my son, who's two. I was in for my appointment and mother-in-law was watching my son in the waiting room. My son was wandering around and got behind the counter. Mother-in-law went after him to get him to play where he's supposed to. A lady, who we will call Karen, walks in and says, Excuse me, I need to book an appointment. Right as my mother-in-law stood up, the lady then saw the kid, Karen. Why the heck would you bring a baby to work? Mother-in-law, I don't work here. Karen, don't lie to me. You're the only one out here. Mother-in-law, the secretary just stepped out for a minute. I'm sure she'll be right back. Then why the heck are you behind the counter? Because my grandson ran back here. He's only two and he doesn't know any better just yet. Sorry. Whatever, just get behind the computer and book me an appointment before I have you fired. At this point, the actual secretary walked into the room. Secretary, sorry for taking so long back there. Karen, it's about time you came. Fire her. She points at my mother-in-law. Secretary, looking really confused. She doesn't work here. She's just waiting for her daughter to finish her appointment. But I'm back now, and I'm able to help you with whatever you need. Karen, with a nasty look on her face. Yeah, fine. Whatever. I need to book an appointment. So they booked her appointment, and she left. My little man apparently ran behind the counter again and the secretary said, My, aren't you the cutest little worker we have? I finished my appointment and on the way home, mother-in-law told me this story and asked me to post it for her. So I did. Entitled mom wants to use my car money to pay off her debt. My mother, entitled mom, has a problem with money. She has about 10 credit cards and owes over $3,000 to her boss because she borrows money. I have to pay $1,250 to her each month for rent and pay all of my bills on my own, which is $50 for my phone and food slash necessities. I try not to ask her for money unless I absolutely need it or can pay her back the next day. This leaves me with no savings and nothing left over by the time I get my last paycheck. Well, I'm getting promoted to a position with a slightly better pay, which could help me start saving for my future. The catch is, I have to have reliable transportation as I'm being transferred to a location that is 15 minutes away, instead of 5 minutes from my house, and an open availability. My mom drives our only car to work in the morning and doesn't return until evening, so I have to work night shifts. I give just about all of my money to my mother so we won't be homeless. I don't have money to do things with friends, buy myself anything, and my job is very mentally and physically demanding. I basically do slave labor because everyone has seen money except me. I have thought about getting another job, but I already work long hours and don't get much sleep during the day because my mom is a very loud person and talks to me slash keeps the TV at max volume, etc. Asking her to be quiet does not help as she always says, You're always asleep when I get home. You sleep all day. You're just lazy. When I was your age, yeah, when you were my age, you were also getting in trouble. Well, my grandmother lives very comfortable and offered to give me my grandfather's car because he can no longer drive and I am in need of a car to continue my career. 
I expect to stay with this company as the people slash company take good care of its employees once they get promoted to management. Unfortunately, the car was stolen before we could drive down to pick it up. My grandmother in turn offered to give me $4,500 to buy a new car. My mom tells me this, along with her plan on how she's going to use my money. The conversation went roughly like this. Entitled Mom Gran said she wants to give you $4,500 for a car. Me That's cool and all, but do you think they will find the car? Entitled Mom, ignoring me like usual. What I'll do is fix the oil leak on this car. From when she drove after a surgery instead of calling me and crashed. $800 and then pay off my boss, and then ask Gran to co-sign a car for me, and I'll make the payments and you can drive this car. 2003, always needing a fix. Me. How much do you owe your boss? Entitled Mom. $3,000. Me. No. What do you mean, no? I don't get anything out of that. It's not my fault you owe that much money and have debt because you keep buying furniture and shoes you never wear. Literally. Dozens of brand new shoes that sit in their box while I wear the same two to three pairs for the last two years because if I want new shoes, I need to buy them. Entitled Mom Then I won't have a car to drive to work and you will have to take me and pick me up every day. Me I'm sorry, but if anyone is going to have her cosign, it's going to be me. You have terrible credit. I have no credit. I want to build my credit and have something of my own. Your $3,000 debt is not my fault and you're not going to use my car money and make promises you can't realistically keep. And I'm not driving an unreliable car that you ruined. At this point, she just starts screaming about how selfish I am and that she's only been in debt because of me. She picked an expensive place to live so she wouldn't have to spend an extra $100 on gas per week, even though we pay around $1,000 more on rent than if we lived 45 minutes away from her work than 10. She buys herself clothes and shoes and jewelry that she never wears because she never goes out. She drinks a lot and lounges around after work until she goes to bed. Lazy sound familiar? Did I mention she has a desk job? She keeps using Finger Hut to buy ninja kitchen stuff or swaps out furniture because you can buy moderately expensive items on payment plans, except they add about $100 to $300 which she would rather pay to get the item now than save and get it later. I have no idea if my grandmother is giving us a check or cash, but I hope it's a check in my name, as my mom would not give it to me otherwise. She'd say something like, You're irresponsible. I'll hold on to it. Or, I already told you, I'm using the money. Do you know how stupid that would make us look to my grandmother? She would never offer to help us again because she would feel scammed. I would be out of a car and unable to fulfill the promotion demands. I'll be stuck in the same boat I am now, giving all my money to my mom and not having a penny to my name a week later. I'll update this when something happens, like getting the money or, hopefully, the stolen car being found and getting it. Edit. The rent is not just $1,250. Rent is around $2,200. It may seem like a lot for an apartment, but it's actually a really nice two-floor townhouse with community amenities, security and a gate, vaulted ceilings, good location that stays cool in summer, and I now get to have my own bedroom, which I have never had for myself until I was 19, and a personal bathroom slash shower and a walk-in closet. I pay half the rent and give her money for car insurance because she has a great driving record and it's cheaper to have me on hers than my own. Edit 2. She won't steal my car. That would be pointless. She can't sell a stolen car. My county is really good on that. Unfortunately, the car I should be getting, which is stolen, is two counties away where car theft is common. She doesn't want my car. She just wants the money because it's already coming. Karen throws food and drinks in my face for not giving her free parking. Happened a few years ago during a football game. The home team's college was providing free parking for game attendees in various lots near the stadium. I used to live very close to the stadium just a block or two away, with a gravel front yard as a driveway. Some people are thrown off by our driveways being parallel to the road, but they usually understand it's not a parking space as there is usually grass between the driveway and road. Unfortunately, the day would come where I would meet a wild Karen in front of my family and we would all almost go to jail for it. It was a single mother Karen in a pickup with her kids 
and she had not only pulled into my driveway, but also blocked the gate to my house. My car was in the driveway, so she had to drive over grass in order to park on my driveway, which should have been the first. Almost immediately, my grandpa confronts her and tells her that she was on my property and that free parking was two houses down. She didn't take too kindly to that and started screaming about how we're supposed to provide free parking to all visitors. I rush over to the source of the yelling from the neighbor's house and find an irate Karen yelling at my grandpa, so I ask her to leave when she demanded the free parking promised by the college. We told her this wasn't part of the college and to go literally two houses down to get a free space or directions to one by a college staff. More yelling ensued and I decided to take pictures of their license plate plus make and model in case I need to call the police. The daughter saw me take a pic and jumped out of the truck to yell at me before going back to yell at my grandpa. There really isn't much to say about the daughter because I couldn't understand her through her screaming. When I told Karen she needed to leave before I called the cops, she responded by throwing drinks and food at me and my grandpa before I promptly slammed her car door and caused a drink to bounce off the window and spill all over the interior of the truck. At this point, people have gathered around to watch. A few moments later, the cops arrived and separate us. They talked to witnesses and us first before talking to Karen, who responded to everyone's testimony by claiming we said something illegal. Where I live, there are laws restricted on what you can say and Karen was hoping to get back at us by accusing us of violating these laws. I don't want to get into details because it's a very hot topic and I learned to just be quiet and deal with it. The police officers detained us for questioning, but one of them saw straight through Karen's ploy and they explained what we can and can't say. If someone else reports us for saying the wrong thing, then they would personally come back to arrest us. Karen was then given a huge fine and told to leave. In the end, Karen wasted valuable time, got a huge fine and made a fool of herself in front of everyone when she could have just drove a couple houses down. Karen needs this house. Over the past couple of months, I've been looking at rental properties in anticipation of moving. I have to be out of my current house by October due to the landlord wanting to demolish my current rental house to build apartments on the land. Yesterday, I went to an open house to view a rental property. I discussed it with my partner. We both agreed we loved the house and wanted to fill in an application for the property. We've got the real estate agent, we've got the Karen, and we've got me. I head up to the agent and ask her how we should go about applying for the property and ask a few general questions about the property. This is what happened. Me. So, how do I apply for the property? Agent. Well, you can grab one of these forms or apply online. How many people over 18 will be living in the house? Me. Just two, my partner and myself. The agent gets her clipboard and takes two forms off of it and hands them to me. Agent. So, just fill out the forms and bring them back into the office with your ID and payslips. At this point, Karen storms up to us and snatches the forms out of my hand. Karen. I need these. I am going to apply for this house. Agent. Okay, well, I do have more forms available. She gets another two and goes to hand them to me. Karen snatches them out of her hand. No, she isn't applying for this house. I am applying for this house. The agent looks confused. Agent. Ma'am, more than one person can apply and then we send the forms to the owner and they can pick who they want to rent the house to. Karen shrieks. No one can apply for this house other than me. I need this house. I need it. No one else can apply for it. Agent. Ma'am, I'm fairly certain anyone looking at this house probably needs it too. If you fill out an application, I'll send it on to the owner with the rest. Karen, still yelling. I've already applied for six houses and no one will rent to me because someone wrote on my rental ledger that I damaged their house. I need this house more than anyone else here. No one else can apply, so the owner will have to rent to me. Agent. Okay, ma'am. Fill out the application and I'll send it to the owner. Karen smugly says okay, clearly thinking she has won and takes her forms. Karen. You can finish the open house if you want, but make it clear this house has already been leased and don't hand out any application forms for my house. She leaves. The real estate agent and I exchange a look and start laughing. Agent, here are two more application forms. I've heard about this lady. She has applied through our agency a couple of times, 
Apparently, she did over $2,000 worth of damage to the last two properties she rented, and our agency doesn't even send her application on to the owner because she's so difficult to deal with. She will be lucky to find anyone willing to rent her a house. Anyway, send your application form through when it's completed, and we will forward it to the owner. Me. Thank you. I hope you don't have to deal with any more crazy people. The agent laughs, and I leave with my application forms. As I'm going back to my car, I see Karen walking towards me, screaming that I need to give her the application forms in my hand. I jump in my car, lock the doors, and drive off. It was a crazy experience. Would you rent a house to someone if you knew they were a Karen? Or not? Please let us know. You don't deserve to rent your house to me. Am I the jerk for making my wife look bad after she had a girl's night? My wife and I had our daughter six months ago, and yesterday night was going to be our first night to ourselves since her mom offered to babysit at their house. We're both new parents. Things have been chaotic. Our little angel is teething, and we haven't known a good night's sleep in months. We haven't had much time for ourselves as a couple, so having one whole evening of baby care off our hands felt like a blessing. We were both excited for Thursday when it came around. Close to 3 p.m., my wife asked me if it's alright if she goes to her friend's house for a girl's night instead. By now, her parents have already stopped by and taken our daughter back to their place. The fact that she brought this up last minute bothered me. I said this was supposed to be for us, and I've been looking forward to it all week. She looked sympathetic and said she understands, but it's been months since she spent any time with her best friend and really needs this me time. And okay, I get it, she deserved a break but I feel like I had a right to be at least a little disappointed. My wife said I should go to my brother's and do our own thing, but I didn't. After she left, I decided to drive to her parents' house to pick up my daughter. I wasn't in the mood to do anything and wanted to be home, so there was no point in them babysitting. If I wasn't going to spend the night with my wife, I'd rather be with my daughter then. My father-in-law was confused I was there so early to pick her up when we agreed we'd come get her at 11 p.m. I explained my wife's change of plans and figured I might as well take my daughter home. My wife got back around 10 and she confronted me because I guess her mom sent her a text message. Nothing offensive, just that she didn't think it was fair she changed the plans her and I agreed on when they offered to babysit so we can spend time together. Her mom did say it's perfectly reasonable to want to be away from the family and go hang out with friends, but not when it was supposed to be our time. She said I purposely made her look bad and I made myself out to be the victim by picking our daughter up early and not having my own fun when I could have just as easily had a guy's night too. Then I made myself seem like the poor husband stuck at home with the baby while wife has fun. I tried to back myself up, but clearly our conversation went nowhere. We haven't talked since last night and I'm still wondering if I did something wrong. Should I have not said anything to my in-laws or did what she said and went out? I mean, I was disappointed she chose our first night off to go be with her friends and my mood was ruined, but I didn't do all this to make her look bad. Am I the jerk? Well, who do you think is right, OP or his wife? Please let us know. She had a girl's night and didn't invite me? <coughs> Fairly aggressive, girlfriend stole from my bank account, so I sent her academic career into a nosedive. I'm a senior at a large state university. This happened in the first semester of my freshman year. I was selected for an honors type program that placed me in a co-ed dorm building with every other student in the program. As a dumb freshman, I rushed into a relationship with a freshman girl who lived right above me. We'll call her Megan. It was convenient for me to date someone who lived so close, but everyone else in our building hated Megan because she talked a lot and almost exclusively about herself. She bragged often about being a fairly aggressive person, but somehow I overlooked that mile wide red flag. Right after Thanksgiving break, at the end of an evening class, I got a call from my mom who noticed some unusual activity on my checking account. Back then, I had no credit card, so this account slash debit card was my only access to my savings while I lived on campus. I rarely needed to buy anything during the semester, so I was puzzled to find that $104.29 had left my bank account over two weeks in the form of six Grubhub food orders. At this point, I trusted Megan but I decided to ask her about the money right away. She denied any involvement and suggested that I cancel my debit card. After a really long phone call to the bank, I did just that. Next, I reached out to Grubhub customer service on Twitter. Hey, my card was stolen and used for food orders on these dates. Can I have the receipts? They sent me the first and last receipts, but they had to redact the personal info on the account holder. 
I say redact in quotes because they just used the Snapchat draw tool and Megan's name was still clearly visible on both receipts. What's more, the most recent receipt was only two hours old. She was probably still eating when I chopped up my debit card. It's worth noting that she and I both had unlimited dining plans paid for by our respective parents and we lived 500 feet from the nearest dining hall. She didn't need to order food and she definitely didn't need my money to do it. So I texted her again. I have the receipts from Grubhub. Are you sure you didn't make those orders? Her reply, forget you for suspecting me. Fairly aggressive, wouldn't you say? I hatched a plan to collect security camera footage of her picking up the order from that evening. However, by midnight, Megan arrived at my door in tears and confessed to everything. Plus, she admitted to being a serial shoplifter. Exhausted, I sent her away and decided to deal with everything in the morning. By the next day, everyone in our building seemed to know what was going down, probably because Megan had already begun broadcasting her version of the story. I sent Megan a breakup text and decided that $104.29 was a loss. At least I escaped unscathed, right? Well, less than two days later, she entered my room when I wasn't looking. I was sitting at my desk when I noticed her standing silently behind me. Megan, give me my stuff. Where's my stuff? Me, what stuff? You know. I did not know. She tore through the room looking for something that she refused to identify. Just as quick as she came, she was gone, and I locked the door because obviously this wasn't over yet. Within a minute, she was back. She stood outside my door, knocking and demanding I let her back inside. The knocking quickly got more violent. She started shouting, I know you're in there, open the door. Mind that we lived in this building with students in our program who all know each other and all of them could hear her. Pretty quickly, Megan was rattling the handle of my door. Next, she began throwing herself at it, shoulder first, trying to break it down. I lived next door to my RA, but judging by the lack of any intervention, he was elsewhere. So I whipped out my phone and texted him to send backup. Meanwhile, I saw my heavy wooden door bending and buckling. I even heard it crack a bit. My RA was on duty in another building, so he sent three of his colleagues to de-escalate the situation. They brought Megan downstairs where she revealed that the stuff she wanted was just the t-shirt and keychain that she gave me for my birthday. Whatever, I let her have those. I still just wanted this to be over. However, once I shared my story with the resident life staff, they filed university paperwork to place a no contact order between me and Megan. They also recommended I contact the campus police who then told me I should get my stolen money back in small claims court. I couldn't even get there without a car or money to pay for an Uber. Sorry, Judge Judy. At the request of the campus police, I also contacted the Title IX office at my school, sending them the story of everything you've read so far. They were interested, to say the least, although I didn't want any trouble. I just wanted a clean breakup and a fresh start, but a Title IX representative informed me that they were bringing three misconduct charges against Megan, theft, threatening slash violent behavior, and inciting an intervention by university staff. The representative asked me to serve as a witness in Megan's disciplinary hearing the next semester. I tentatively agreed right before the representative set the hearing date for February 14th, Valentine's Day. I thought it was a joke, but they really did that. When the day of the hearing finally arrived, the no contact order was still in effect, but a few of my friends had kept tabs on Megan. For starters, she failed all of her classes in the fall. Someone in my math course confessed that Megan had tried to hook up with him while she was dating me, and he had to repeatedly tell her no. Even worse, Megan kept telling a twisted version of the whole story to try and turn my friends against me. So when I found out that she had found a new boyfriend, it felt good to know that the Valentine's Day disciplinary hearing ruined whatever evening plans they might have made. I arrived alone at the disciplinary board office, unsure what to expect. The board consisted of grad students and the hearing was expected to run into the night. Unlike me, Megan did not come alone. She brought both of her parents as character witnesses. That wasn't even a thing here. This wasn't a real courtroom, as you'll see soon. And that's not all. Megan's parents also paid a lawyer to defend her against the charges. The board knew that was unnecessary, but Megan's parents believed so strongly in their daughter's innocence that they had already paid this three-piece suit make her case. In the name of fairness, the board members offered me pro bono legal representation, a junior economics major, who we'll call Jimmy. Jimmy had already read my account of the events from the fall, and thanks to my screenshots of Grubhub receipts, he said there was an okay shot of the charges sticking. 
Then I told him something I had kept secret for months. When Megan tried to break down my door and I whipped out my phone to text my RA, I also filmed the whole thing. Jimmy couldn't get enough of the video. There was Megan kicking and screaming and clearly trying to break into my dorm room. It was all the evidence I needed and no one saw it coming. In the hearing, when the time came for me to make the case against Megan, Jimmy played the video on a big screen in front of everyone. The room went insane. In that instant, I realized that Megan really had convinced everyone I was the liar. In her version of the story, I gave her permission to buy food using my account. She told her parents that she had asked me politely for her belongings, which I had rudely hidden from her in my dorm room. In Megan's story, I was the sociopath trying to ruin her reputation. Before I unveiled the video, it was her word against mine. I still didn't want revenge, even after finding out that Megan tried to cheat on me. But when I saw her parents flipping out at the video, why didn't you tell us you did this? And her lawyer raising heck, this evidence was not provided in pretrial disclosure and a board member standing over him. Sir, this is not a court of law. Please return to your seat. And him shouting, objection. And her replying, we don't have objections. This isn't a court of law. And Jimmy, my new best friend, just trying not to laugh out loud. That's when I realized how good revenge can feel when it's fair and deserved. The board found Megan responsible on all three charges. My side of the bench recommended the university terminate her housing contract and force her to pay restitution. Her side recommended only restitution and a reprimand. The board compromised. Her family paid back most of the money she stole. Most, because two of the six orders had the same price and the lawyer convinced the board I had duplicated an order. And Megan was forced to move into a different dorm building. This probably would have helped her anyway, because every student in our program's building knew everything she had done and lied about. They wouldn't speak to her, and no one wanted to be her roommate. By the time she had to move buildings, she had already failed all of her courses again. Having paid for her tuition, her unused dining plan, her lawyer, and her restitution, Megan's parents finally pulled her out of school. Where are they now? Last I heard, Megan returned as a part-time student, but I never saw her again because the no-contact order still stands. I'm now Facebook friends with the guy Megan tried to hook up with. Oh, and Jimmy and I connected on LinkedIn. As for me, well, I no longer date fairly aggressive people. Has anyone ever stolen anything from you? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. I love stealing things from people. Am I the jerk for walking out of a job interview? I, 26 male, got offered an interview for a job I've had my eye on for quite some time. I was scheduled to meet with three people within the actual office itself, and considering this was a job that could be done remotely, that raised my suspicion, but I still decided to learn more about the position. When I got there, the first interviewer, who was with HR, took almost 20 minutes to call me in. The receptionist was nice and all, and kept trying to reach out to them to see what was taking so long. But nonetheless, that irked me the wrong way. My interviewer eventually walked into the lobby and told me to follow him. No apology for the long wait. To describe him, he was a tiny guy, about 5'6", and spoke in that weird valley girl accent, important later. The actual interview went off the rails really quick. My interviewer was rude to me and cut me off a lot. For background, I live with my parents because they have health issues and I help take care of them, so moving out isn't an easy option for me or them. When the interviewer asked where I lived, I told him I lived with my parents in this town. He laughed and asked if I was too scared to move out. I was still trying to be professional, but he kept making snide remarks about some of my experience, the state school I went to, etc. I eventually got fed up and felt like I wasn't going to get the job anyways, so I decided to tell him, you're being really unprofessional, so we're done here. He got mad and said, so you don't want to meet the team you're interviewing with? I told him, no, if HR is this unprofessional, then I can't imagine what everyone else here is like. As I was leaving through the lobby, the HR guy followed me and tried to embarrass me by saying out loud to the receptionist, he is no longer welcome here. If he tries to come back in, call the police. I told him to shove it and go make out with his boyfriend. So that way, no one has to hear his voice. Then I left. I had never walked out of an interview in my life, no matter how well or bad they went. I did kind of feel bad for skipping on the other two interviews, which would have been with some of the managers on the team I would be working with. But I absolutely hate most HR departments as it is, since they produce some of the most toxic people. And if this HR guy was really unprofessional, I question the company as a whole. Well, what do you think? Was OP out of line in how he handled this situation or not? Please let us know. Everyone sucks here, bruh. 
Except for the receptionist, she seemed sweet. Entitled parent tried to steal my plane seat because she needs it. This story happened a few years ago when I was about 13. So a bit of background. My relatives live in a city that's about an hour and 20 minute flight from where I live. My parents and I used to go there every three months or so. However, sometimes my parents had to work and I had to fly alone. On the airline we took, if you flew alone and were under the age of 14, you had to be a UM, unaccompanied minor, which would mean a flight attendant would help you to get to your gate and you would board first. But the best part of being a UM is how you would usually get upgraded to first class if it's available so you can be close to the flight attendant. It's important to know that on flights that are shorter than three hours, the seats are in two by two formation. So I get the seat my parents paid for in economy, a window seat. Next to me was the entitled mom with a toddler in her lap, and on the other aisle seat in our row sat her husband with another kid. After everyone boarded the plane, the flight attendant comes up to me and says, You're the UM, right? Me. Yeah. You've been upgraded to first class. Me. Cool. The flight attendant didn't see entitled mom's husband and thought she was a single mother. Ma'am, there are two seats available. Would you like the other one? It was common for flight attendants to ask the people next to someone with a priority if they wanted to get a first class seat too, if one was available. Entitled mom. Sure. Can my husband come too? Flight attendant turns around and sees husband. Oh, sorry ma'am. There's not enough room for the both of you. But why? You said there were two seats available. Flight attendant. Yes, but one of them has to be taken by the UM. Entitled mom turns around and looks at me. He's big enough. He doesn't need those seats. And you need them? Yes, I do. Do you not know how hard it is to raise not one, but two kids? Flight attendant. Ma'am, I do know how hard it is. I have kids of my own. So then you'll know why I need those seats more than him. Ma'am, we will be departing very soon, and I need to bring this boy to the front of the plane. Now I need you to cooperate and let me bring him to a seat. Listen here, you jerk. My life is hard enough as it is now, and I don't need your insults on top of that. We deserve those seats. Give them to us now, flight attendant. All right, look, kid, just come with me and we'll deal with her later. As I'm getting up, the entitled mom pushes me back down in my seat. Forget you. You do not just ignore me like that. You are going to give me those seats right now, you little jerk. At this point, everyone on the plane is looking at her. Even though I wasn't saying anything, I was kind of scared. My mind was set on being anywhere but in a seat next to this woman, so that's when I practically jumped out of my seat to the flight attendant. As I got in the aisle, the entitled mom starts pulling on my shirt to bring me back. That's when I grabbed her and threw her off of me. How dare you touch me, you little jerk! Now you have to give me your seats! Instead of listening to her, I just went up to my seat in first class. I could still hear her screaming. Eventually, they deplaned her and her husband, which delayed the flight by 10 minutes. On the way out, the entitled mom gave me the stink eye and said, You're so selfish. I just grinned at her. After I told the story to my family, we laughed a lot about it. I don't want my laptop back. I want that one. Happened a few years ago. I own a small IT company. We specialize in other company support, but we do hardware and software servicing for home users. We are a very small company, so we all do most of the work required. Every time the home user brings a PC or a laptop to fix it, we add it to the system and issue a case number. Every piece of equipment has a small sticker on it with the case number. Every part taken off the PC or laptop has one too to avoid confusion or parts mix up. About a week ago came a lady. She brought a laptop to be cleaned, so it was added to the system and a case number was issued. We gave her a credit card sized card with case number and our contact phone number to check the status if she needs it. After about two days, I called her. It's ready to pick up and she can come. We've got me, we've got Karen. Karen, hi, I came to pick up my laptop. Me, okay, what is the case number? I don't know, I lost my card with the number. Me, okay, what is your name? I can look it up in the system. No need. I can see my laptop on the desk over there. She pointed to some gaming laptop on the service desk where we store hardware that needs to be fixed. Me. I'm sorry, but that laptop is not ready yet. You called me to pick it up, so I came. Me. It must be some mistake. Can you tell me your last name, please? Okay. My name is Karen. I looked into the system, and I saw her laptop was ready to pick up. I checked the number, and her laptop was on ready to pick up desk, so I brought it back to her. This is not my laptop. It is that one. No, madam. It definitely is this one. 
but I don't want this one. I want that one. If you're not going to do your job, just call me your manager. I'm gonna get you fired. Me. I'm sorry, but that's not possible as I don't have any manager or the boss. I'm the owner of this small IT company. I can give you only your laptop or I can call cops for trying to steal someone else's laptop. Her jaw dropped. Five seconds I stare, grabbed her laptop, and she disappeared. Another beautiful day at work. Did she really think we're so dumb we would let her steal someone else's laptop? Nice try, Karen. I should fire myself. Thank you for reading. Am I the jerk for golfing and leaving my wife at home with our son? My wife and I have a 10-month-old son, our first kid. We also both work full-time, so our kid is in daycare during the week. My job is Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. My wife's job requires her to sometimes work later in the evening or on weekends, depending on what kind of project they're doing. If she has to work weekends, she usually takes a day off during the week to compensate for working a Saturday or Sunday. If she takes a day off during the week, she usually uses that time to catch up on stuff around the house, like cleaning or laundry. But sometimes, she will use that day to spend time with friends or family and go do something fun because places aren't as busy during the week. She also sometimes takes our son out of daycare on those days so they can go to places like the zoo or aquarium when it's less crowded. So if she has to work on a Saturday or Sunday, I'm at home with the kid and don't have the same opportunity to get out and see friends. It's also more difficult to bring our son places on weekends by myself because there are a lot more people around and due to what's going on. This past weekend, I had a tea time scheduled with a few friends for Saturday morning. But Thursday night, my wife tells me she has to work Saturday, so I can't go golfing. I tell her that's fine and that I will tell the guys I have to reschedule for the following weekend. She then tells me that she's taking Friday off because she works Saturday and that she and her mom and her aunt are going to some art festival that's in town. Again, fine with me. She said she'd be home before I get home from work and I do the drop off and pick up from daycare anyway, so it doesn't change my schedule at all. After my wife gets home from work on Saturday evening, I tell her that I would like to go golfing early Sunday morning since I missed out with my friends. She gets a little upset and tells me that she's exhausted from work and was really hoping to relax on Sunday and recharge a bit and that she can't do that while watching our son by herself. I told her that I just watched our son all day by myself and I'm tired too. It's part of being a new parent. She also had a free day on Friday and because she worked Saturday, Sunday is my only free day of the week. I told her that I need a break just like she does and that I don't have the luxury of taking days off in the middle of the week to go to art festivals. She didn't speak to me the rest of the night, but the next morning I was up at 6am getting ready to go golf and she was mad. She thought that we had an understanding that I wouldn't go because she told me not to. I told her I would be back around noon and I'll call on my way home to see if I should bring home something for lunch. When I got home, she handed me our son, grabbed her lunch and went to our room to rest for the next few hours. When I went to talk with her, she called me a jerk for leaving her when she asked me to stay home. Edit. Since some people seem to be jumping to the conclusion that my wife is a toxic and emotionally manipulative monster, I need to clarify something. My wife and I actually just talked over lunch. I reminded her about my tea time tomorrow and she said that she remembered and that she hopes I have fun. She apologized for how she reacted last weekend and that she was tired and exhausted from work that day and let that anger get the best of her. She had worked 10 hours outside in 90 degree heat that Saturday and was fully drained, so the idea of chasing a 10 month old around by herself while already exhausted sounded daunting. Neither one of us did a good job of communicating clearly in the moment. She said she knows I need and deserve breaks just like she does. My wife does not treat me like a jerk on a regular basis. Our relationship and communication is really quite healthy considering everything we have going on right now. But like every other relationship, we are not perfect and have moments where that communication breaks down. Nice lady asks for help buying a computer and we get free CDs and job offers. This is going back to the late 90s when Circuit City was still big. My friend and I were somewhere near the end of high school and were there to look for a couple of CDs. A bit about us and what we were like back then. Nerds. I was a wannabe computer nerd with literary pretensions and my first goatee. My hair was blonde and my beard was orange, naturally. I was probably wearing flip-flops, khaki cargo shorts, and a far side or umbro shirt. My friend? He was on a whole different level. He was over 6 feet tall and skinny. He always wore khaki slacks or jeans. We're in Arizona in the summer a polo shirt with an undershirt and Birkenstocks with socks. He had grown his hair long and about half a year earlier he had a perm to try out an afro. He hadn't cut his hair since. He was and is a computer nerd who really knew his stuff. He looked like he worked at a store like Circuit City. We had his mom's mid-80s suburban. So anyway, 
We found our music, Third Eye Blind's first album for me, and headed over to the computer area to dream. He was building a gaming computer at the time and wanted to show me the video cards he wanted and was explaining the pros and cons of a couple different types. An older lady, probably in her 50s, approaches us and asks him for help when he's done helping me. I say I'm just here for music and looking at computer stuff for fun and my friend says he can try to help her. To be fair, I'm pretty sure he dressed the way he did because he liked this kind of thing. She wants a computer for email because all of her friends have email and she feels left out. The selection is overwhelming and she doesn't know where to start. We head over and quickly start narrowing down the selection for her. My friend is way overthinking it and I convince him she needs bare bones capability for basic internet, email, and probably some basic word processing. We get a computer with built-in modem and monitor picked out along with a mouse and a keyboard and make sure she knows how to use them to click on files, that kind of thing. Then my friend explains how to get internet to the computer and I write down notes for her so she can remember later. We even offer a few suggestions on what email to get and show her how AOL instant messaging and chat rooms work if she wants to really impress her friends. The whole process took quite a while but we didn't have anything to do and would have been bored otherwise so it was something to do. We help her get everything together, check out and help her get in the car. Then we head back in to get our music, pay and figure out what to do. We're heading to the checkout when we see the lady coming with the store manager. She's going on about how helpful we were and praising my friend for being such a great employee. The manager and my friend are both trying to explain that he doesn't work there. Finally, she realizes we're just two random guys and starts apologizing and now we're embarrassed and insisting we were happy to help. She insists on buying our music for us. After we get checked out and say goodbye to her, the manager pulls us aside and offers us both jobs. We both say we'll think about it and my friend later decides to work there. He gets a couple of other friends hired there. We were moving, so it wasn't a good time for me, but I thought it was pretty cool still. I know this isn't the usual format, no one was irate, for this sub, but thought I'd share anyway. Hope you enjoyed. Karen Demands My Cat This story happened 5 weeks ago. Also, I am 15, but I look like I'm 19 with a goatee, 5 foot 11 and 175 pounds. Cast We've got Karen, the bad lady. We've got me, the nerd, and we've got Agatha, the cat. Here's the story. So I've been looking for a cat for a while. After around three months of searching, I think I found the right cat for me. At this pet store, you can go in and ask an employee to help you warm up to an animal. In my case, Agatha the cat. As I walk into the store, there are very few people. This is great as I won't have tons of people coming to watch me play with my cat. I walk over to the cats and signal an employee to come over. They ask me simple questions about allergies and experience. No allergies, two years of experience with cats. But after all that is done, they finally let Agatha out and she is immediately happy to be in my company. But this story is in this sub for a reason. The employee has to go back to the front to ring someone up. There were only two employees and leaves me with the cat. After a few minutes, Karen steps onto the scene. Keep in mind, she has the haircut and is about 40 pounds overweight. She walks around the store and eventually notices me playing with Agatha. Karen. Hey, you. Me, completely oblivious. Karen. Ah! Quite loudly. Me, slowly looks back. Karen. Well, you going to do anything? Oh, I think you should know that I don't respect elders. What I mean is that I treat everyone the same no matter what. I am a firm believer of the golden rule. Me. What do you want? Karen. Wow. Food. Give me that cat. Me. First of all, I'm getting this cat. Second, did you grow up in the slumps of McDonald's? And third, I don't work here. Karen. Huh? How dare you disrespect me like that? Me. Yeah, I'm going to go back to playing with my pet. I planned on getting her. Karen. I don't care. I want it. Stomps her foot like a toddler. Me. Sweet Cheez-Its. You are immature. Karen. Give me! Reaches to take Agatha. Note the physical difference. Six foot of height in my favor, 60 pounds in her favor, and a slender frame with lengthy wingspan and legs on me. I am easily able to evade her efforts. Karen tries to rip the cat out of my hand. At this point, Agatha is trying to get out, and I think any cat owner knows what is coming next. The cats in the store aren't declawed, so you do not want to make them mad, and Karen made her mad. Agatha starts jumping and pouncing on Karen while Karen falls to the ground. Karen is screaming and I call an employee over. 
Me and the employee are able to calm Agatha down and get her off of Karen, but not before she beat Karen up pretty good. She was escorted out of the store while using enough words to make even a drunken sailor blush. I later bought Agatha, and we have had a very good time together. Thank you for reading, and have a good day. Speaking of cats, do you have a cat? And if so, what's their name? Please let us know. I prefer poodles, to be honest. Am I the jerk for forcing my vegan daughter to cook me? My daughter, who's 16, has been vegan for about a year. Me, my husband, and her brother, who is 14, have tried to be as supportive as possible. We aren't a family that eats meat daily, so it wasn't that hard for me to accommodate her. When I do cook meat, I always make something else for her and keep the side dishes common for all. She does have some separate dishes, but most are common and I clean it if I have to cook for her. A few months into the vegan lifestyle, she tried to convince us to go vegan and would get increasingly angry when we said no. Me and husband shut that behavior down hard and told her that she can follow whatever diet she wanted, but she cannot expect others to. She sulked for a while, but stopped doing that. Last weekend, I cooked the family a big pot of chili, a small vegan one and a large beef one, so that I can refrigerate it and use for the next week. Next day, I found the fridge empty of both the chili and turns out my daughter decided that we were all being too callous about meat. She felt the smell was too much when she opened the fridge door and that she can't eat anything from the fridge after that without gagging or throwing up. She told me that I need to throw out all the vegan food in the fridge and restock them. Me and my husband were livid. Wasting food is never okay with us and that was a lot of food. I told her I'm going to continue using the vegan products in the fridge and she can either eat it or not, but I am not wasting food. That whole week, she kept making faces at dinner while she ate. As a punishment, I gave her the recipe and told her she needs to buy them and cook it next weekend. She yelled and begged, but I stood firm. In the end, she did it. When the cooking was finished, I told her that wasting food is never okay in this house and pointed out that instead of X amount of meat being used, two times the amount of meat. Since this seemed to be confusing, I meant as in X amount in the pot she wasted plus X amount in the new one. I didn't purposefully make her put more than what was used previously. Now she started crying and yelling at me about how awful and disgusting I was because I not only forced her to buy meat, which she is very much against, I also forced her to cook it and now I'm telling her that it was her fault. She's really upset about this, so I am wondering if I went too far. Should I have picked a different punishment? My husband and brother definitely think what I did was right, while my parents think I was in the wrong. I thought I would put it up to a vote. Am I the jerk? Well, what do you think? Did OP go overboard on her daughter, or did she get exactly what she deserved? Please let us know. I dare you to touch my chili. Write me up for simple mistakes to get me fired? Prepare to get fired. I told someone this story, and they directed me here. Anyways, private security was my field up until a few years ago. When I say security, I don't mean mall cops, but high-end, armed, trained security. I spent a few years working a job in another city away from home, but the company went under, so I decided to move back home. I found a security job online. It was simple entry level, basically sitting behind a computer. You were security for the building, but monitored security for other sites the company owned across three states, like small repair places, factories, places where they stored vehicles, etc. So I submitted my resume. The next day, a guy calls and sets up an interview. Awesome, because I needed to find work fast. Went to the interview, conducted by a woman I'll call Jane. She was the supervisor, and the guy I talked to was her boss. Jane immediately told me I was way overqualified, which I found strange, but okay. Interview went fine and I left. A few hours later, she called and said I was hired and set up training days. Now, I won't go through that, just wanted to give background, so let's go to the good parts. She always gave me a cold shoulder. Her boss found out I have all the qualifications, licensing, and training to be armed, so he had me come in armed. Nothing fancy, just basic equipment. She would always make comments about how everyone should be armed. A few of my coworkers I wouldn't trust with a water gun, and she would decide who is armed. Just little comments to get under my skin. Then one day, it happened. I was working the front desk slash reception that day, and she sends me a message over Messenger telling me she needs to see me. I go back. She drags me to a side office with a write-up form. Apparently, when I added door access to a visitor's badge, I added the door to the gym in the basement. A mistake, but not life-threatening. A week later, I didn't sign my timesheet, another for not filling in a form correctly. All minor things everyone has done or did. 
The end came about nine months into the job when I looked at this new timesheet. I was paired with a new officer who had been there a month, only he was listed as shift supervisor. Confused, I took it to her second in command. I'll call him Bob, a great guy. He told me that he's brought it up, that I had the experience and seniority to be promoted and she basically told him to buzz off. It was her choice. Anyways, that got me mad. So I started planning my revenge. I don't normally do this, but I knew one more write up I would be fired, no matter how minor the infraction was. Good thing is, during the shift, there is only two people and we can't see each other's computers. So I started thinking. I remembered about four months prior, her car broke down in the parking lot across the street. Instead of having it towed, Jane's father decided to fix it there. No big deal. Only during that time, Jane was bringing her husband back into the security office. This was a huge deal. The office took scanning at three doors and a keypad to enter. In the whole building, only the security staff and one cleaning guy had access. It was the HQ for the company, and not even the executives had access. From our computers, we could open any door, turn off any camera or alarm, and open any gate in any building that the company owned. So it was a big deal because we had the keys to the kingdom. That was a huge violation. So I hatched my plan. Under the excuse of having a smoke, I went out to reception and copied the visitor log from those days. I then went back in and accessed the video feeds. You could go back a year for all video feeds and took screenshots of her husband interning the doors in office. The office itself had no camera, as well as with the timestamps, him leaving, and the fact he never swiped in, which following someone into a door, even if they held it open, you must scan your card. I logged into my private email and sent it to another email knowing they don't log what you do on the computers. I got home and sent all the pics, the log copies, and everything to not only her boss, but his boss, whose job was investigating breaches and theft. I also included every dirty trick she pulled playing favoritisms, etc. The fallout didn't take long. Two days later, a Friday, I went in for afternoon shift and Bob was at Jane's workstation. I looked confused and said Jane was suspended for a week and that Monday I had to come in and speak with her boss and boss's boss, but I would be paid for it. Also, everyone was interviewed. Great rumors were flying around and I was laughing on the inside. Okay, interview day. I go in and they started questioning me. They knew I worked while she brought her husband in and asked me. I spilled everything after acting scared and getting assurances it would be confidential and I wouldn't be punished. I didn't tell them I sent it, but they asked everyone. I left out some things in the email and added some things that weren't. I didn't want to be labeled as a snitch. It went on for an hour and I left. Next day, an email is waiting. Jane was fired, Bob was in charge until a replacement is added. I had a long talk with Bob that day. Turns out, Jane was scared of me because I was more qualified for her job than she was and knew I was her boss's golden boy. She was afraid, rightfully so it turned out, that I might take her job and admitted to him she wanted me gone. A fact he told them in his interview. Also, that she didn't want to hire me, but her boss made her. Turns out her boss was aware of things and looking for an excuse to fire her, but it had to be big. Jane had been working at the department for 10 years. It was her first real job and security was all she knew. They blacklisted her, which means unless a company was really desperate, she wouldn't get a security job anywhere in the state. Icing on the cake. I know you want to know. Yes, I was offered her job. No, I didn't take it. I told them that Bob deserved it more. He did, and that I would be happy being a shift supervisor. So that's where I stayed for the next two years until I left. Have you ever had a coworker try to get you fired? If so, what did you do about it? Please let us know. Oh, I love getting people fired. Am I the jerk for dropping my sister from our family vacation? A year ago, I, 31 female, decided with my parents that it would be really fun for the four of us to go on a family vacation to the tropics. My sister, who's 28, has had some issues and works in a very low paying job. However, she has been there long enough to have accrued a good amount of vacation time. I offered to simply pay for her trip and accommodations, no questions asked. Needless to say, she was extremely happy to be joining us, at first. She came to me months after we booked the trip, saying that the time we had chosen to vacation didn't work for her because it's a busy season at her job. This bothered me because she's constantly complaining about people taking vacations during the busy season, which means that you absolutely can do it. I suggested she simply ask her boss, and if he said no, we would change the vacation dates. Everything had already been booked, and we were going to lose money by shifting the dates around. So she outright refused. 
she refused to ask her boss if she could have the time off. She said it would be weird to ask such a request during a busy season. I asked why she didn't tell us about this busy season sooner when we were booking, or why she couldn't simply text him and ask, and she started flipping out on me. We cleared the days with her first before booking originally. I don't humor her when she's like this. She has a nasty habit of throwing tantrums until she gets her way. For the next several months, I kept asking if she had asked her boss, and she kept insisting that she would not ask him for any time off at all. I finally told her that if she didn't ask for the time off, she wasn't coming. She flipped out at us and decided that she would excuse herself from the vacation entirely. T minus a few weeks, she finally freaks out and decides to ask her boss for the time off. Her boss literally tells her that any time off request can be granted so long as it's at least three months out. However, waiting until the very last minute, he can't give her time off. Yes, you read that correctly. There are no blackout days for her work vacations. She literally could have picked any day, regardless of the time of the year, just like I said. At this point, my sister went into full meltdown mode and demanded that we cancel the vacation and schedule it for 2022. Needless to say, we will be going without her. She outright refused to even ask for the time off. Her friends have since convinced her to completely write us off. Yes, she is writing us off because we invited her to a tropical vacation with all expenses paid, but she refused to even ask for the time off. Am I the jerk? What do you think? Is OP the jerk or is her sister? Please let us know. And you people call me entitled. Does this look like a restaurant? So a few years ago, I worked at a restaurant slash bar. I would get off work around 3 or 4 a.m. On the day in question, I ended up clocking out at 4.40ish a.m. and had to stop by Wally World to put up groceries for the week. We've got me and we've got Karen. Keep in mind that I'm wearing all black. Black slip-resistant steel-toed shoes, black slacks, black belt with silver butterflies because I wanted to, and even my hair tie was black. Other than the butterflies on my belt, the only color I had on was my name tag, which was a green apple. So I'm at Wally World and have finished almost all of my shopping, just needed shampoo and conditioner. I was sitting on the floor looking at the shampoo and conditioners on the bottom shelf, trying to find some that don't have anything I'm allergic to in them. When Karen comes up to me, this is what happened. Karen, where is this brand name item that I can't remember? It used to be on the next aisle. Me, doesn't look up thinking she was talking to someone else. Karen, getting louder. Where is the item? Me, picks up a different shampoo bottle. Karen, put down the shampoo bottles and answer me. Me, finally looking up. What? Karen, where is the item? Why do you people insist on moving everything all the time? It's ridiculous. Me, I don't even know what that is. How would I know where it is? Maybe if you did more than just sit on your butt, you would know where things are. Then you'd be able to help customers. Me, shaking my head in confusion. I don't work here. Don't lie to me. I can see your name tag. Me, standing up and putting my shampoo and conditioner choices in my cart. You mean the green apple that no Wally World employee wears? It doesn't matter. You have to help me. Me, does this look like Apple Restaurant? <laughs> no. Well then, I don't have to help you. You're in uniform with a name tag. That means you have to help me. Me, let me explain something to you. I've been awake since 8 a.m. and at work since 10 a.m. I just clocked out a little less than an hour ago. It's 5.20 a.m. I don't have to help you with anything. I'm going to get my groceries, pay, and go home so I can pass out for a few hours before I go back to work. You can buzz off and just leave me alone. How dare you? Get me your manager, now! Me, pushing my cart away. Bless your heart, but you don't know how to listen. Have a blessed day. And off to the self-checkout I went. Moral of the story, don't mess with someone who's been awake for more than 20 hours. Am I the jerk for blowing up at my mom and telling her that she was the reason I had no friends in high school? I've always been pretty shy and quiet. I had a small group of friends in high school, but my mom has always seen this as a huge disappointment. When I was in 9th grade, there was a guy in 11th grade that I had a huge crush on. I hung out after school with him in a group once, but my mom didn't like his attitude when she met him and banned me from seeing him. All because he didn't thank her for picking me up. One day I sent her a text letting her know I had plans after school. She asked who I was going to be with, and when I told her it was the friend who knew the guy I liked, she flipped her lid and asked if I was seeing the guy. She didn't believe me when I said no, and then called around 14 times. I wasn't supposed to be using my phone, so I didn't answer her calls, and because I was ignoring her, she came down to the school and then embarrassed the heck out of me. 
We lived five minutes away, so there was plenty of time left during lunch for everyone to hear the chewing I was about to get. She dragged me out of there by my arm and screamed at me in the hallway, calling me a liar and saying that with my attitude, I'm going to have problems. The plans I had suddenly fell through after that. I let it go, but I had the reputation of having a crazy mom and suddenly nobody but my small friend group wanted anything to do with me. Everyone thought my mom was going to terrorize them or get them in trouble with their parents. That stuck all the way through high school and now I'm apparently a giant loser to my mom and she wastes no opportunity to let me know how sad she is that I'm like this. Today she came to visit and made comments about how she's glad one of her kids has never had a social life because I'm usually available when she wants to chat. I got fed up today and finally snapped and let her know the actual reason I didn't have any friends and she got so upset. She cried and screamed and said I was blaming her for being a loser, which I guess I was. But the way I see it, if she wants to keep bringing up high school, let's tell it like it is. She left not long after and spent like 5 minutes bawling in her car before she left. Here's where I might be the jerk. I didn't plan on telling her that. I just reached my breaking point today. She's crazy as heck, but she's my mom and I don't want to intentionally hurt her, which I clearly did. I also didn't mind not having many friends. I'm still close with the ones I did make and I'm pretty shy anyway. I have no way of knowing how many friends I could have had but she took that chance and burned it before I could even try. All that happened like two weeks after ninth grade started. Both my siblings called me to tell me I was being a jerk because I made our mom cry. Hello? My own mother has been straight up calling me a loser for quietly dealing with the repercussions of her actions. Any remorse I had is now gone. In my opinion, she can deal with one hard truth after she's made fun of me for years. Edit. I ended up writing way too much originally and had to edit out a lot, so I'm going to give a quick rundown on some things I've seen in the replies. I have plenty of friends. I'm 23 now and making friends isn't something I would say I struggled to do when I started interacting with people who were actually interested in being friends. I don't see anyone in my family that often, especially my mom. She's made every attempt to turn me into an emotional crutch, I now realize that. But she lives two hours away, so I see her once every couple of months when she comes to my city at most. I've been a pushover, but I'm done doing that. When I woke up today, I had 30 missed calls from family members, so I called my mom back and told her that she needed to quit putting my siblings against me, and if she wants any form of a relationship, she's going to need to make some serious improvements. I wish I drove there myself. I feel like I could hear her jaw drop over the phone. I called my brother and sister and gave them the same speech, but they reacted the way I thought they would. Guess it's a good thing I'm close with my soon-to-be in-laws and my boyfriend's family. I have a feeling mine won't be around for much longer. A couple celebrating their anniversary turned an insanely busy shift into my favorite shift of all time. This past Saturday was crazy and ended up being our top grossing day since we reopened. Our dishwasher was broken and all four lunch servers were doubles, as were two of the four bartenders. I worked from 10 a.m. to 1 a.m. with no break. There were people waiting outside for us to open at 11 a.m. and still so many people there close to 11 p.m. when we have to have everyone off property according to state mandate. I knew I'd be working straight through as a double since I was on the patio and we had live music, but around 4 when the rest of the night crew showed up, my manager told me I wasn't going to get new tables for 10 minutes so I could eat. As it goes, this info wasn't passed to my hosts and I was set right before pre-shift. This poor two-top sat for almost 30 minutes before saying anything. Someone got their drink order, and when I came over and apologized for the confusion, they were ready to order. They were so chill about it and made sure I knew it wasn't a big deal. So on to the anniversary couple. The husband had sent this beautiful flower arrangement to the restaurant ahead of time to be put on their table. They told me it was their 49th wedding anniversary and their last name was our restaurant name. The name of the place I work isn't something that would typically be a last name and it's 49 years. I was so excited. Another table asked their server about the flowers and sent them two glasses of champagne and they were so appreciative. The host was worried they'd want to move tables because they were too close to the band, but they loved it. They were the sweetest couple and loved everything they had to eat. Every time I talked to them, they had something nice to say about the food, drinks, atmosphere, band, etc. Now, one of the best parts. The table that sat for 30 minutes waiting for a server told me to put the couple's bill on their tab. I had already been close to happy tears during all of this, but the floodgates opened after that and I had to take a minute to collect myself. After they finished dessert and I told the couple their bill was taken care of, they were so appreciative. 
I carried their flowers for them when they left, and all the tables we passed were congratulating them and cheering. The husband stopped at the bathroom, and I was talking to the wife. She was close to tears and telling me how special we made their day. It reminded me why I work in the industry and why all the stress and craziness is worth it. We help make special events special, and I love that. Just make the price what it says on the box. I work at a retail store that's part of a franchise. The owner is a piece of work. To give you an idea, they openly boast about all the nice things they have and all the vacations they took and aren't shy about how this business is a ploy to line their pockets further. They make us compete for our hours by our sales while paying a measly wage and being so stingy with how much they let us work. Also refuses to work with your schedule if you have a second job. New hires usually don't stick around because they can't compete with the people who already work 30 hours and naturally have higher sales. The only reason I'm in the position I'm in is because everyone else who worked here quit at once two months into my employment because our boss can be so grating. Also, whatever they say is law. I got reprimanded when I started for cleaning the glass because we have a rule that's all work stops when there's customers in the store, but also got told to clean the glass while there were customers in the store, so I wasn't just standing around. It's a lot to deal with sometimes, but I don't mind doing it until I find a better job, which I have. For a while, I was the only one that did the pricing. I liked it that way because I knew I did it right. I scan the items, make sure the price is correct, and if it's not, I change the price in the computer so it rings up correctly and put a new label on it. One day, after we had hired like four new people, I noticed a bunch of price labels were weird. My boss likes prices that end in zero or five. For example, $30 or $75. There were prices ending in two and seven, and I thought that wasn't right, so I called the boss and tried to explain the situation. I guarantee they didn't even listen to my explanation because they told me three times just change it in the system to the price it says on the box. Whatever is on the box is right. I knew it wasn't, but I was told to make the items the price that was on their boxes. Our store has roughly 25 sections that each have around 30 to 70 items. I got through two and a half sections that shift. The next day, my boss is waiting for me with a folder. I got a 20 minute lecture on how to determine the price of an item and how to change it. When I told them I knew already and that I wasn't the one that priced them incorrectly, they accused me of trying to push the blame for doing it wrong on someone else. Yeah, I kind of got the short end of the stick in that situation, but there was something deeply satisfying about knowing they had to go through and fix 150 items they instructed me to price wrong. The boss says it, so it must happen. Years and years ago, my father worked for a meat processing facility that was the main source of employment in town and employed hundreds of locals. Everyone knew everyone, so when an outsider gets sent in to shake things up, you just know that trouble is going to ensue, especially when my father, as the union leader, knew how to stir things up. Anyhow, there had been an in-company competition, which one of the workers had won, a couple of tickets to some sporting event. The competition had happened before the outsider came into the anatomies, but the prize was awarded after. Winners were even told that if the event was on a rostered day for them, they would get that day and the following day off with pay. So it comes to the week of the event. The employee happens to be chatting about the event to friends when the outsider overhears. The outsider turns around and says that the employee can't have the day off. Employee wants to know why. Outsider says it's because he didn't put in for time off. Employee says that he didn't have to, explains the competition and prize. Outsider says he doesn't care. The employee did not follow procedure, so he can't go. The employee mentions it to my father, and my father hatches a plan. He goes through the policies and procedures manual, and notes that all employees of the parent company, regardless of whether they are management or normal employees, had to adhere to a certain food safety regulations, including attending a course. Failure to do so could warrant fines by the health department. Now, my father knew that every staff member at the facility was compliant, but he wasn't sure about the outsider. So he contacted a friend in the parent company's HR department, and lo and behold, the outsider was not compliant. My father didn't mention anything to the outsider, but he did to the health department. For the next three months, the health department made surprise visits to the facility on about seven occasions, and the facility passed with flying colors, except for the outsider. The parent company got a copy of each report from the health department, but the facility never did. But my father would get a heads up. So for three months, the company was getting fined because of the outsider. The company bosses showed up for a meeting with the manager, outsider, my father, and a couple of other essential personnel. They covered everything and then went into the fines. 
For someone who was so heavy on procedure and policies, the outsider had nothing to say. And then my father brought up the competition and the outsider started to go on about policies. Company management had heard enough and promptly transferred the outsider to another division and gave the employee a bonus for not being able to use the prize. Don't explain to me how the time clock works until I'm missing hours and I will abuse the system. I left the job I had been at for over 20 years to work for the town government where I lived. I had been salaried, but had burned out and took a job with a lot less stress, but also an hourly position. I was about six months into the job when I was looking at my hours for the week. I was expecting to be into overtime if I stayed until 5. I was planning to ask if I could leave whenever I hit 40 hours since it would be before 5. I realized my hours for the week were going to be short, even if I worked until 5. After calculating the time I worked each day and comparing it to the payroll software, I talked to my boss and was told that the time clock rounded to the nearest 15 minutes. I was upset. This was never explained to me when I started. Based on how things went when I started, it wasn't surprising. For those that don't know how this works, if you clock in between 7.53 and 8.07, the time clock rounds this to 8 o'clock. If you clock in between 8.08 and 8.22, the time clock records this as 8.15. When I did the calculations, there is a potential to abuse this to swing your hours worked by 2.5 hours every week, meaning I could work 37.5 hours and get paid for 40, or I could work 40 hours and get paid for 37.5. I looked up federal labor laws and this was absolutely legal. Fine. From then on, I never clocked out in the 7 minutes past every 15 minute increment. I'd leave for lunch at about 11.53 every day and get back at 1.07. Time clock records an hour. Get to work at 8.07. Leave at 4.52. If the time clock said 4.53, I'd go back and work until 5.08. I wouldn't have done this if I had been informed up front. Obviously, I couldn't completely adhere to this schedule, but I tried my hardest. So the best example of my abuse of the system was that I lived about 5 minutes from work. Occasionally, my kids would lock themselves out of the house. They got home around 3 p.m. The first time I asked my boss if I could go let them in, which seems stupid that I would need to ask, she says to me as I'm walking away, make sure to clock out. I think it was meant as a joke, but obviously I was going to clock out. I'm hourly. It just rubbed me the wrong way. So I got to the time clock, clocked out at 3.08, drove home, let my kids in, drove back, and clocked back in at 3.20. Time clock sees a 3.15 clock out and a 3.15 clock in. If she hadn't said anything, I wouldn't have rushed home or back and I would have had to make up that time. If how the time clock worked had been explained to me when I started, I wouldn't have abused it. Karen keys our car because it's too loud. Characters. We've got me, my brother-in-law, my sister, Karen, my mom, person one and person two. So it all started when I decided I wanted to start learning stick. Since my brother-in-law is the only person I know with a manual car, I had him come over and teach me. When the car starts up, it does make a rather loud rev. We make sure to do it in the afternoon as to not wake people up and trying to be considerate. Anyways, it was about the third or fourth day of him teaching me when she first appeared. Karen, nice car, bit too loud for my taste, but it's still nice. Me, oh thanks, mind trying to keep it down a bit? My baby doesn't really seem to like it that much. Me, yeah sure, we've been driving in the day so it doesn't wake people up. I didn't know anyone around here had a baby, so I'm sorry about that. It's not a problem. Just be quieter, okay? And with that condescending tone and a smile on her face, she walked off, which kind of made me mad because I just thought it was a friendly chat. It wouldn't be the first time people have talked to me about brother-in-law's car thinking it's mine. I've grown to accept that people will think whatever, so I play along and just tell brother-in-law about it later. Two days go by with no sign of her. I wake up, get ready, and wait for brother-in-law to come over so we can start my lesson. I walk outside, and lo and behold, she was there. Karen, I thought I told you to keep it down. Me, sorry, I can't control it. It's just how the car starts, and we're not going to leave it running while we're not in it. That's a waste of gas. Karen, I don't care. Stop being so loud. With that, she was gone. It always annoys me when people complain about cars being loud. A car is a motor vehicle with a combustion engine in it. Of course it's going to make noise. Brother-in-law got to my place and off we went. We came back to my house to eat lunch. 
About two or so hours later, my sister and mom came over and told brother-in-law and I to go look at the car. The entire driver's side was scratched up and even a tire was popped. Only one person came to mind when I saw it. Karen. We, meaning me and brother-in-law, walked down to her house, which was only a few houses down, and knocked on her door. All we hear come from the other side is, I'm not apologizing. So this led brother-in-law to say, Then you better have a good case in court, you jerk. That's going to cost a lot to fix, and I'm suing you for every cent. Karen, maybe keep it down then, you jerk. Brother-in-law, maybe don't go keying cars and popping tires, and you won't get sued, you jerk. This went on for about 20 minutes. We head back, call the police, and get everything ready for what was about to come. As soon as they got there, we started to explain what had happened. How I was learning stick, how the car was, showed them the damages, told them what the Karen had said, etc. We were making sure our side was accurate, so we made sure our timeline was correct. After a while, we walked with the police to her house, and it went down about as well as you'd expect. Officer 1 Excuse me, ma'am. Can you come out here for a minute? This is the police wanting to speak to you about the car. Karen I'm not apologizing. I told them to keep it down and they didn't. They deserve it. Officer 2 Ma'am, what you did is against the law, and they're pressing charges. You have five minutes to get out here, or we will get a warrant for your arrest and come back. Karen Nice try, but I'm not stupid. I know my rights, and you're not allowed to enter my home without my consent or a search warrant. Officer 1 That's only partially true. We can't search your home without a warrant. However, if we have a warrant for your arrest, we can legally enter your home and place you into custody. She was stubborn. Again, they went back and forth a bit. After the allotted time set, we went back to my house. The cops left to get a warrant and we waited. Currently, the lawsuit is in order and the trial is in a few days. She is in police custody. I have never found it easier to drive a stick shift knowing I won't have to deal with her condescending ways and tones. Edit. First off, stop calling us rude because we couldn't keep it down. We tried to be quiet, but either way, she overreacted and we also did go to a parking lot to practice. Like I said, we went back to my house for lunch the day she keyed the car. Where do you think we were all day? Also, thanks for all the awards. I really don't post on Reddit in general, so it feels weird having them on a post. Also, we won the case. We got the money, the car is being fixed, and she is moving. Her choice, not the judges. Edit 2 so I keep seeing some bits talking about the case. I want to apologize for me wording it poorly. We've basically won is what I meant. We have two cops that can confirm she admitted to doing it. We have pictures and we've been looking around the neighborhood asking if anyone saw her actually do it and so far no one has. I apologize for me being an idiot and having improper wording. Speaking of loud cars, do you like loud cars or not? Please let us know. Free Karen, she did nothing wrong. Entitled Mother Ruined Her Son's Prom Photos This happened last year. Some brief exposition. Important to know is that I'm South African and we don't have proms here, but we do have Matrix Farewells, which I guess you could call a prom's first cousin. I'm just going to refer to it as prom anyway, because it's easier to type. So I'm a photographer and usually around August slash September, we get swamped with pre-prom shoots. For in case anyone doesn't know what that is, it basically means that before the event, we meet up with the student and his or her date and take pictures of them together. Their families usually join too to make the job more insufferable. Last year was no exception to the norm and on one particular day especially, every photographer at my company had been booked and had been sent to different places. I had been hired by a mother to shoot photos of her son and his date and she had been an absolute joy to deal with. So my dread wasn't anything beyond the regular distaste I felt for these gigs. For this story, I shall refer to her as Nice Mom. I arrived at the location about 10 minutes early and called Nice Mom. She didn't answer. Realizing that I had no idea what anyone looked like, I decided to just stay near the entrance and wait for them to call me back. Around me, there was an ocean of couples, all with their own photographers. I'm guessing there must have been at least 50 or 60. I tried calling Nice Mom again. This time, she answered. I told her where I was waiting and she said they would come find me. I waited for a few more minutes before seeing the cavalry approaching from a distance. The group was considerably larger than I had anticipated and the woman marching up front looked nothing like I had pictured the mother. Are you OP? She said without saying hello. Her voice sounded different too. Yes, I am, I replied. Are you Mrs. Nice Mom? No, I am Mrs. Entitled Mother, she said back, already sounding annoyed. 
Oh, where is Mrs. Nice Mom? I asked. Here I am, Nice Mom yelled out, suddenly appearing from the back. My son and his friends are sharing a car, and I knew you wouldn't mind taking some pictures of us too. Karen cut me off. I raised my eyes internally. Every year I had at least one person doing this, and every year it caused issues. We had actually updated our contract specifically to avoid this from continuously happening. I started explaining the contract to her, but then saw the already defeated look on nice mom's face. So not wanting to cause her any embarrassment, I decided to just go with it. Yes, I know, I'm a pushover. Now, because there were so many couples doing their photo shoots at the same venue and my clients had been a little late, we were rather limited for spots. We were also quite limited for time as I now had to photograph two couples and two families in the same amount of time. And before anyone asks, it's not because I'm a clock watcher, but because all students were assigned a unique time that they were meant to arrive at the hall in order to make their grand entrances. I lead Nice Mom's family to the closest available spot and told them to align for their photos. Immediately, Entitled Mom chipped in, pointing to a wooden door close by and asking why we weren't taking pictures there. Because there are others currently taking their pictures there, I replied with a half annoyed tone. So go tell them to finish, because we want to take our photos there, Entitled Mom snapped back. No thank you, I said, not looking at her as I spoke. I started photographing Nice Mom's family, paying no further attention to Entitled Mom and completely missing as she waddled over to the other photographer. I have no idea what she said to them, but whatever it was, it must have worked, because less than two minutes later, she returned and said we could now go take the photos at the door. As the door was, admittedly, much prettier and now available, I told Nice Mom and her family to all move there and we'd quickly retake the photos we had just taken. When are you doing my family? Entitled Mom yelled. When I'm done with Nice Family, I replied calmly. You just did them! Entitled Mom yelled again. I wasn't finished, I replied again. And when are you taking photos of my son and his date? She snapped. This time, I ignored her and just continued taking photos of Nice Family. I finished them rather quickly and then started ushering Entitled Mom and her family to the spot. Remember to only take pictures of my good side, Entitled Mom said. I'll try my best, I said, internally rolling my eyes again. I aligned the family and took the first set of photos before asking the brothers and sisters to fall out. I want to see the photo, Entitled Mom said. Ma'am, we really don't have time. But then how do I know you know what you're doing if you won't show me the photos, she yelled. Well, maybe you should have thought of that yesterday, I said, no longer trying to hide my irritation. It took about twice as long as Nice Family, but finally I finished the family photos. Time was really working against me now, so I started rushing the two couples to follow me. The two couples obeyed and we started walking away, just for me to see Entitled Mom following as well. No, you're done. You can just wait here with the rest of the family, I told her. But how do I know you're going to get enough photos of my son? She snapped. Well, I can tell you that every moment I'm standing here is a moment I'm not getting photos of him. My irritation was now regurgitating and I was doing no effort to hide it. Fortunately, Nice Mom came over and escorted Entitled Mom away with her. The couple photos were pretty painless as Entitled Mom was no longer in sight and I could therefore focus on the job I was actually there to do. The whole set lasted just under 30 minutes and I was almost done. The only thing standing between me and my escape was the individual photos of the two boys and then the photos by the car. I told this to the two boys as we were walking back, telling Nice Mom's son that I would do his first. Now I'm not sure if this was some sort of Candyman effect or what I had said three times, but just as I finished those words, Entitled Mom suddenly appeared, demanding to know when I'll be taking photos of her son. Right after I do his, I said, now relatively calm again. Why does he always get to go first? Entitled Mom demanded. Because his mother is my client, I said matter-of-factly. Well, you better make sure there are enough photos of my son too. I won't stand for you treating him like he's second best, she yelled at me. There were so many reactions that went through my head at that moment, but I bit my tongue and just gave her a smile that would make Harley Quinn fall in love with me. I spent around four minutes doing nice son's photos and then started looking around for Entitled Mom's son. I spotted him far away, posing for a group photo with his friends and a different photographer. I walked up to him, telling him it's time for his individual photos. He kind of brushed me away, saying that he'd be with me in a second. The second became a minute, then two minutes, then five minutes. My time was almost up, so I walked up and asked him again. I got the same answer. Again, I took a step away to wait, 
only to again be confronted by Entitled Mom demanding to know when I was going to be taking his photos. I explained to her that I've been trying, but he keeps ignoring me, arrogantly throwing in that I'm just his photographer and not his parent. Entitled Mom looked at me furiously as I said this and then demanded I go get him immediately. I obliged, walking up to him again and once more trying to pull him away. This time, he did actually start to follow, but after dragging after me for about 10 feet, ran back again to go pose for a big group photo with all the boys. By the time this was all done, we were officially out of time and I hadn't shot a single car photo yet. Still, not wanting to awake the beast that was entitled mom, I told him to pose for about a minute getting the basic shots before he told me that he really did not want these individual photos. That was good enough for me, so I hurried him over to the car, got some okay photos of him, his date, and the other couple standing in front of it, and then let them leave. I was actually feeling quite proud, having finished everything and going less than 10 minutes into overtime. Cut forward about 10 days later, I had delivered the photos the day before and nice mom had sent me a message raving about how perfect everything was and how much they loved the photos. I had just pulled my car over at another job when my phone rang. A voice spoke on the other end. Is this OP? This is him, I said, not having a clue who I was speaking to. This is entitled mom, she said. How can I be of service? I replied. I still had no idea who I was speaking to. I'm just going to start by saying that I'm having a really bad day. I'm sorry to hear that, I said, in a tone asking why she was telling me this. I hired you to take my son's prom photos, she yelled. My mood plummeted as I suddenly realized who it was. I asked you for one simple thing, and that was for photos of him alone, she said in an eerie tone. There were photos of him alone, I said. Did you not get them? There were five, she screeched. I'm sorry. How many did you think I was going to include? I said, sounding amused. You have ruined the most important day of his life. To be clear, if there were six instead of five, would his life be more complete? I continued. My sarcasm was now taking control. What do you plan to do to fix this? She yelled. Well, I guess I could refund you all the money you paid. I said jokingly. Darn right you will. She yelled again. Great, send me your details, I said, almost laughing, before hanging up the phone on her. She tried calling me again, but I refused her phone call. I did send her a professional email later just to cover my side, but never got a reply, and I never heard from Entitled Mom again. Speaking of proms, have any of you ever been to a prom? And if so, did you like it? Please let us know. I was actually the prom queen. My competition all had very unfortunate accidents. Client wants us to create a design exactly like their ugly PowerPoint. We comply. As a designer, I try to educate my clients on design and why something has to be done a certain way. My agency is not cheap, so we make it quite clear that they are paying for our experience and knowledge, not some Photoshop monkey. Most of the time, my clients are appreciative and enjoy the extra guidance and professional advice. Occasionally, we get fun jobs. The sales pitch went well enough. The business owner, Bob, seemed like a decent guy and happy to trust our professional expertise. However, shortly after signing the deal, he brought on a new manager, Karen, who was put in charge of marketing, including the new website we were just contracted to do. It quickly became clear that Karen thought of herself as a multidisciplinary genius and despises us because she thinks she can do better than a professional design agency. Karen loves sending over incomprehensible design instructions and feedback in the form of design mock-ups she creates in PowerPoint. Her designs were ugly, but we try our best to translate the abominations she birthed into good-looking professional design proposals that best reflect the intent of her ideas. Karen did not like it one bit. Karen was rude, uncooperative, and removed Bob from the email threads when we tried to reach out to him to get his opinion. When we sent over a design, she would complain about how it wasn't what she wanted and scream over the phone while our team patiently explained why we couldn't design exactly as she wanted. Mainly, it would be ugly as heck and nobody would want to do business with them with a website like that. The last time Karen complained about how we were stupid morons for not doing what she wanted, we got her on the phone with Bob. She was screaming incomprehensibly and nobody got a word in. Finally, Bob took her side and said, Karen is extremely experienced and knows what she's doing. I want your team to follow every instruction exactly as she asks. No problem. Once again, Karen sent over a ridiculous 70 megabyte PowerPoint. If we followed it exactly, it would look like a website from the 90s with the worst UX ever. 
We went through every little pixel of her PPT, asking her, so do you want us to copy this exactly? To which she would reply with a smug yes. So we documented her instructions down to the letter to cover our butts. Once again, we asked Bob, are you sure? Reply, yes, please hurry up and make those changes exactly as she asked. Okie dokie, we copied every ugly font choice, every terrible gradient, every hideous element into the design. We even went the extra mile to export the ugly lopsided shape she drew as PNG graphics so it would all be exactly as she wanted. Then we sent the design over. Here is the design. We have done everything exactly as you instructed. Karen once again replied, taking Bob out of the loop. Perfect. Now, it wasn't so hard to do things exactly as I asked, was it? We waited. Bob exploded, demanding a meeting the very next day to explain why we were delivering such shoddy work. We go to the meeting and Karen starts demanding that we propose a completely new design. We presented all past designs, the document in which Karen confirmed that she wanted all the changes, the countless emails in which we painstakingly explained to her why her ideas suck, and finally, the last email in which she praised us. You see, Bob, after our last call with you, we had followed Karen's instructions to the letter, exactly as she had asked. She seemed very happy with it. I'm confused. Why the quick change of heart? I then pull out the contract and calmly point out the portion which stated the number of design proposals we would create. Karen had used up all of it. I had reminded her that she was limited to X number of proposals, but she clearly didn't remember any of it because she didn't bother reading our emails and would keep talking or yelling over us when she spoke on the phone. I looked Bob in the eye and told him he could either pay extra for each additional new proposal Karen wants or choose from the existing designs done. They ask for some time to discuss privately. We break for coffee. Well, Karen is extremely experienced in this field. We will go with the last design since it's exactly as she wanted. Even my intern couldn't hold back his surprise. As we drive back to the office, he asks, Is Karen hooking up with Bob or something? Why does she have him by the grip like that? I shrug. It's his business, and we're getting paid anyway, and he clearly doesn't appreciate our design expertise after all. The less time we spend arguing with them, the more time we could use to focus on my appreciative, good clients. We make Bob and Karen sign off on the design and finish up the project quickly. Karen still tries to be difficult, but we stick to the contracted terms and she couldn't do anything. Two months after the project ended, I get a call from Bob. He began with some small talk about innocuous project-related business, but I realized it wasn't the purpose of his call. Karen had been fired after making more serious mistakes, causing major losses to his company. He sounded contrite, but did not offer any real apology. That's terrible, Bob. I'm so shocked. I thought Karen was extremely experienced and knew what she was doing. Edit. Sorry guys, as much as I would love to show you the site or Karen's presentations, I'm afraid I must keep things anonymous. You'll have to trust that it looks every bit as terrible and outdated as a website designed by Karen could be. We did not put our company name in the footer, and it is obviously not included in my company's portfolio. I stole it, but only on Mondays. So I volunteer for a driving service locally. Few hours per week, I drive the elderly to the doctors and to the shops and such. My only responsibility is to bring them from A to B and back. But as it is often very frail, weak, or small people, I go in the shop with them and help them get stuff on shelves and such because I want to. It's a small community. A number of people know me in the area. This is fine. Well, I drive on Mondays only. This happened last Saturday when I went to the shops to do my own shopping. A lady I had not seen before. Not the typical Karen look. She looked like a normal lady in her mid-50s, visibly stared at me as I walked past her. I think nothing of this. People are weird sometimes. I go about my shopping and she follows me. I know this because I do a pretty unusual tour through the aisles since I know what I need and where it is. Near the register, we've walked past at least three uniformed shop employees by now. She just jams her card in front of mine, blocking the way. Karen, excuse me, since you're obviously free, why haven't you offered to help me? I stare for a good 15 seconds because I don't know what I could possibly help her with. That she thinks I work there doesn't occur to me I've never worked a day of retail in my life. I'm a journalist, nothing even close to what she's after. Me. With? Karen. My shopping. If you need help, I suggest an employee. But you are free. I don't work here. Obviously not. This startled me. I didn't expect her to agree with me. <laughs> then why would I help you? You work for the local service. Me. No, I'm self-employed. I volunteer there on Mondays. 
Then help me already. By now, other people have started peeking into our aisle, her shrill voice having alerted others. I can see one of the other shopkeepers debate whether or not to step in. Sadly, no. Me. It's not Monday. If it was Monday, I still wouldn't help you because it's a member-only service. You're not a member. And if you were, I still wouldn't help you because my only responsibility is driving people around. I help sometimes because I want to, and I certainly don't want to help you. Well, I don't care. Okay then, neither do I. I give her car to push and walk past with mine to the register. I start unloading my stuff. The cashier is already giving her and me side eye because she can see this isn't over. Karen, if you don't work here, how are you going to pay for that? You are going to pay, right? This startled both me and the shopkeeper. It's so dumb, I'm literally speechless for half a minute. Apparently, this shop is the only way to earn money now? I don't even know. Me. No, I figured I was just going to rob the store to be honest. It is Saturday after all. You're so rude. I pay for my stuff and she's still following me, having abandoned her cart in the aisle. I stay near the counter to pack my groceries while she hovers around me still. You understand I'm not going to help you at all, ever, right? I'll get you fired. I'm self-employed. I'm pretty sure I'm not going to fire me. I manage to make it out the door, put my cart back and carry my stuff to my car. I almost think I ditched her when she appears again, next to me, yelling in my ear. That's not your car. I have a small seat, nothing fancy, but I own it outright. By now, honestly, I was just having a laugh at this lady. Then why do my keys unlock the door? I've seen your car. I mean, we're standing in front of it. No, your real car, the Volkswagen. It dawns on me what she means. The local service has two brand spanking new giant seven-seater electric cars completely covered with stickers, ads, and so on for the driver's service. Cars are white, stickered orange and green, very distinctive. It's tacky, but the cars are great for people with limited movement because they're big. How anyone could think a car with all those ads belongs to a random person is beyond me, to be honest. Me. That's not mine. This is. I just drive it sometimes. That's illegal. It's not? Have a great day. By the way, the store has probably put your stuff back by now. She ignores this completely as I get into the car, lowering the window so as to not tempt her to open the door or something. Karen, how did you get this car? Now, I'm a fairly small woman, just over 5 feet, very friendly face, generally quite approachable, but with a loud voice when I try. I tried. Me. I stole it, obviously. Took out the owner as well. Keep yapping and I'll show you where I left him. With that, I throw the car in gear, absolutely stomp the pedal to the ground, and race to the other end of the parking lot. I see her frantically scramble to what I assume to be her car, but by the time she's in it, I've pulled in the traffic and am pretty much out of her sight. Just for fun, I parked a little down the road from my place, next to another identical seat, same model, same color, very similar license plate, just in case she comes looking. Sadly, she didn't. I didn't see her or her car again. I was actually a little nervous that I'd get in trouble with the police or something for yelling that in case she reported me or something, but it seems that she's not that crazy. Am I the jerk for charging my boyfriend rent while I'm paying my mortgage? Hi all. Recently, my mom passed and left me, sole inheritor, only child, her house. Nothing too fancy, but it's a pretty nice house. I've decided to live in it, but there is still a mortgage on the house, so I will need to pay the monthly installments as usual. The year or so before my mom passed, I was looking to move out with my boyfriend, but because he doesn't have a very well-paying job, he was struggling to find a way that we could afford it. Now that I have a house, he wants to move in, and I want him to move in. The issue comes in with finances. I think that since we're both living there, he should pay half the mortgage payment as rent to me. He said he doesn't think that he should pay towards the mortgage because I'll eventually fully own the house while he's just paying rent. He also said that since I earn twice as much as him, I can afford paying the mortgage alone, freeing him from financial constraint. He thinks that I should either pay the mortgage entirely while he pays half for household expenses and bills or put his name on the deed too, so he will have something to show for his paying half the mortgage. I declined and said if that's what he thinks, he shouldn't move in. Am I being unreasonable? Granted, I am benefiting and I will own the house, but my line of thinking was paying half the mortgage is a lot cheaper than paying rent. Also, since we're in a long-term relationship, ideally what's mine is his and vice versa. Thanks so much, everyone. Edit 1. First of all, thank you for all your well wishes and comments. I've gotten some great insight into what to consider when discussing this with my boyfriend. 
I've never owned a house before. I'm unfamiliar with what bills slash charges I can incur, and I'm 25, so I'm pretty new to budgeting too. As many of you have brought up, a 50-50 split is excessive, taking into account his financial situation. I've suggested a 60-40 split, then a 65-35 split, but he stands by his original issue, and that he would still be contributing to owning a house without him, and it's unhealthy for our relationship for me to have this much of a financial advantage over him. Don't really know where to go from there. Edit 2. I've seen a few people mentioning tenancy agreements. I will for sure look into those before agreeing to anything. If y'all have any more tips, please feel free to leave them in the replies. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate this. I knew it would happen, but really hoped it wouldn't. Cast. We've got me. We've got the greeter. We've got nice manager, elder lady, and entitled customer. Backstory. I've been unemployed since September 19th and started working for a shopper delivery program to pay for gas, insurance, and car note. This happened about two weeks ago, so I'm going to be close, but it's memory. So I'm at a store I regularly shop at. It's kind of like Walmart, but it's not. I wave hello to the greeter and head to produce, which is the first section entering in the food side. I'm minding my business, checking the app for the customer's order, and occasionally directing lost customers to items such as avocado or plums, which had small displays. I see elderly lady kind of struggling a bit and decided to see if I can help. Me. Hi, I apologize, but you look a little lost. Do you need any help? I'm a company shopper. Elderly lady. Thank you. I recently moved in with my daughter and have never been in this particular store. I continue shopping for my customer and stay near elderly lady to help her with her list. All is going well and even with my good deed for the day, I'm still on schedule. Elderly lady says to me that she is going to head to checkout and added that my mother must be proud. Enter our antagonist. Entitled customer. Oh good, you're finally done with her. I simply walked on as I assumed he was talking to a nearby employee. Entitled customer rushes in front of me. Hi, do I have your attention now? Me. Oh, sorry, I thought you were talking to an employee. I am, aren't I? No, I don't work here. I don't care if it's near your break time. You still work here. Otherwise, you wouldn't have been helping her. I helped her out of kindness, and I don't work here. I push my cart around him and walk off. I don't suffer idiots or entitled people too well. I'm heading to the front to check out when I felt a hand grab my shoulder. I spin around as best I can. Entitled customer. You don't just walk away from a customer. At this point, I unzip my jacket which, thinking now, should have been a giveaway, as it was one I got at Home Depot, and showed him my shirt with a funny picture on it. Me. Does this look like a uniform to you? I'm going to get you fired. Greeter, go get a manager, now! The greeter gets on the radio and calls for LP and a manager. So we're both staring daggers at each other while waiting for a manager to come by in dead silence. I'm 6'1", 430 pounds, staring down at a 5'10", Maybe 180 pounds, and other customers are gathering around just in case. Enter our hero. Manager. Okay, what seems to be going on? The crowd disperses, and I motion to entitled customer to go ahead and get some rope. Entitled customer. I followed this employee for 15 minutes while he helped an elderly woman. Then he refused to help me. I want him fired, and I want to watch him sign the termination papers. You are not going to protect him. Manager looks at me. And what's your story then? I simply pulled out my phone and showed her the shopper app. Greeter. He shops for people. He's in four times a day some days. Manager looks at entitled customer and shakes her head. It seems like the pieces are finally coming together. Or he can see the code of the matrix as his self-righteous smile faded. Entitled customer. Well then, um, which aisle is cereal? Me, manager, and greeter. Aisle 19. Moral for any Karen or Chad types, don't argue. If you ask nicely, I find many people will help, employee or not. Two elderly Karens demand my leftover food. I have a slight eating problem. Some days I'm not able to eat much, but I still go out to cafes to try to eat. Sometimes I'm able to finish the small dishes that I order, and sometimes I can't even get halfway through. I also eat quite slowly. For this reason, I often like to eat alone. A couple of weeks ago, I was in a cafe and spent about an hour eating, but I couldn't finish half of my food. There were two older ladies, grandma age, sitting at a table near to me, and they asked me if they could take the rest of my food for the street cats to eat. 
I was in Istanbul, which in Istanbul there are a lot of street cats and a culture of people feeding the street cats, which is a very nice thing. I said to the women, yes, of course, and I gave them my leftover food. Fast forward to a few days later, and I go to the same cafe again. The same two grandmas are sitting at the same table next to me where I had sat down, and I said, hello, but only one of them bothered to reply. I ordered my food and started to eat. Today was a slow eating day for me, and I wasn't sure if I would be able to finish. I spent about an hour trying to eat again. While I was eating, I noticed that the only thing the grandmas had on their table was a glass of water with only a few sips left in it. I also noticed that they kept watching me and eyeing up my food. After over half an hour, I noticed that they had reoriented their chairs so that they were now looking directly at me. It started to make me feel uncomfortable, and being watched made it even harder for me to eat. The two grandmas still only had an almost empty glass of water on their table. At this point, I really felt like I was being watched. After about an hour, I decided that I couldn't eat anymore and I was going directly home after, so I asked the waiter to put the rest of my food in a takeaway box. The moment the two grandmas saw that I was finished, one asked me if they could have my leftover food for the street cats, and the other lady asked the waiter to give them my leftover food. This confirmed what I had thought. These ladies had stayed at their table for an extra hour while ordering nothing from the cafe, feeling entitled enough to watch me eat for an hour and then take the rest of my food. If this is an entitlement, then I don't know what is. And as soon as the waiter told the two ladies that I had asked for a doggy bag, leftover food bag, and that I was taking the rest of my food home, the two ladies immediately stood up and left the cafe. Not only did they make me very uncomfortable, but they took up a valuable table which the cafe could have had other customers at for a whole hour, while the ladies ordered nothing and consumed nothing for an hour. Because of what's going on right now and cafes not being able to take in the same amount of customers they used to be able to, they lost business for a whole hour because two ladies wanted to sit there and watch me eat for an hour and then entitled themselves to my food. I was thinking about telling the cafe what had happened, but in the end, I didn't bother. Instead, I'm writing on Reddit to share my story of two entitled ladies. If I go to the same cafe and the same two ladies are there, I'll have to go and sit in another cafe. Well, what would you do? Would you give Karen your leftover food or not? Please let us know. You better. Karen's got to eat too. Am I the jerk for evicting a tenant because they got pregnant? Yes, I know. The title sounds awful. But please do hear me out before making a judgment. I will accept whatever judgment I'm given. I, 30 male, purchased a three-bedroom condo in Toronto, Canada five years ago when I was in my second year of medical residency. Soon after the purchase, I rented one of the rooms to my roommate, female 29, to offset the costs of the mortgage. I live in one room, she lives in the second, and the third is my study slash office. She has been a great roommate from the beginning. We aren't necessarily friends, as in we don't do things together for fun, but we get along exceptionally well. The entire roommate slash tenant relationship has gone swimmingly up until recently. A couple of weeks ago, my roommate broke the news to me that she is pregnant. The father was a fling of hers who does not want anything to do with the kid. The roommate has decided she wants to keep the kid anyways and raise it on her own. To me, that seemed like a huge challenge and I admire her for it. The issue is, while I don't necessarily dislike kids, I have no desire to live with a baby. While the condo is a fair size, I will most definitely be woken up by the babies crying at night. My condo is also where I like to come home to and relax, like a haven after a long work day, and the idea of coming home to a baby honestly seems absolutely chaotic, especially since this isn't my own kid, i.e. one that my girlfriend and I decided to have slash were mentally prepared for. As difficult as it was for me to do this, I told her essentially what I've written here and that it would be best if she finds somewhere else to live. I'm not rushing her out or anything like that. I've given her a six months notice since any later than that would come too close to the birth. She was honestly quite taken aback by this and thought that I was being cruel. Her primary concern is that rent has gone up substantially in this city since she signed on with me. I haven't increased her rent since she moved in, so she's essentially paying 2015 rent. She works as a waitress and will likely need to find a lesser apartment to keep within the same budget. A couple of other considerations are that she was out of work while restaurants were closed, but I did waive her rent for that period. All of the furniture is also mine, aside from her bedroom, so she would need to figure something out on that front as well, aside from all of the kids expenses. I understand her position and I feel horrible about the situation, but I honestly can't do it. Am I the jerk for this? Edit. Thank you to everyone who has commented. 
There have been two great suggestions on how I can make the situation better, which I have taken to heart. I haven't been able to give life much thought lately, as work has been quite busy. Firstly, I have a friend in real estate, and I'm going to see if they can help her try to find some affordable listings. Secondly, as I don't plan to take on another tenant after her and can afford to do this anyway, I have decided I'm going to waive her rent for the remainder of the tenancy. This will hopefully give her a bit of a boost to get on her feet. Well, what do you think? Is OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. Entitled mom and her brat almost get me arrested over a Nintendo DS. I was talking with my friend about this experience and he told me to post it here. So enjoy my experience about me and this unbelievable Karen. First of all, I need to say that English isn't my first language, so there might be some grammar errors. Forgive me about it. This took place last year, in the end of summer, while I was waiting for my flight in the airport after a vacation with my family in Italy. The airport was pretty empty that day, despite it was supposed to be traffic due to a big amount of people coming back from vacations. Anyway, I was playing with my Nintendo to kill some time since my flight was late and I wanted to preserve my phone battery. I forgot my power bank at home. So me, 20, was quietly playing when this woman, who looked like she was 40, and her son, who was probably about 10 judging by his height, got in front of me and started complaining about the flights being late and that she had business, etc. I stopped listening to her because I put on my earphones in an attempt to escape her complaining about this and that. I can't stand listening to people complain. Time passes and a notice comes out from the speakers saying that my flight was going to be delayed again. Sighing, I put back in my earphones and that's the moment where the show starts. Entitled mom comes at me with her kid and asks me something. I remove my earphones and the conversation goes like this. Entitled mom, excuse me, me, yes, do you need something ma'am? Yes, please, you see, my kid is getting very bored here. So I wondered if you could let him borrow your video game so he can relax until our flight starts. Nothing wrong till here, but you see, I don't trust random kids since any time I've let them borrow something, they return it to me scratched, smudged, or even broken. So it was a, no, I'm sorry, for the little brat. The moment I said no, things started escalating. The tone of this lady changed from polite to arrogant, and the volume had risen, and the kid, who was giving me puppy eyes, started to give me stink eyes. Entitled Mom. But why? You're not a kid anymore. You look like you're 25 or something, and you still play video games? Why don't you give that toy to my son so he can use it? You don't need it at all. To be honest, if the kid would have promised to use it near me and return it to me intact, I could have given up and let him play. But he was a kid after all, and I know that they become nervous if they don't have anything to do for a while. But the very moment Entitled Mom started speaking arrogantly, she lost any hope with me. Me. Listen ma'am, I don't let people borrow my stuff if they're strangers, for a matter of principle. So, even if you are some famous person, my answer would still be no. Plus, I recommend you lower your voice because people are watching us. I didn't really check if people were watching us, but it was clear by listening to the volume of her voice that anyone who would have heard this would have been looking at us. Entitled Mom Well, raising her voice, I don't care if people are watching us. Even better, because this way, everyone will know how selfish and how childish you are not letting a kid borrow your stupid video game. The conversation was getting out of hand. I could feel the glares of the strangers in the airport looking at me, thinking I'm some sort of a monster. And instead of saying anything that could worsen the situation, I decided to keep calm and just go on. Me. Ma'am, the only one acting childish here is you. Lower your voice before someone calls security on you. The security will be called on you for being an absolute jerk. And when they arrive, I will have that stupid video game of yours confiscated, you little jerk. I was starting to lose patience, and I quietly say, almost grinding my teeth and still not moving from my seat, me. This conversation is over. Please leave and don't show your face near me again, for your sake. I know that sounded like a threat, but the reaction was as cringe as hilarious. Entitled Mom. Are you threatening me? Oh, you are so messed up. I'm going to report you for this. I thought the conversation was going to end and that she was going to complain to the manager or something. Typical things that Karens do. It was my first time dealing with a Karen. Everything could be fine as long as she would leave me alone. But the real heck starts now. While I was putting my earphones back in, the lady snatched them from me. And while I was going to say something, the little jerk did something that changed forever my view about kids. In short, he came closer and spit in my shirt. I started seeing red. 
me. You little... I say while I try to move away from the brat with my leg, not trying to kick him or anything. Entitled mom. Don't you dare hurt him. After that sentence, she tries to slap me, but I grab her by her arm promptly before her hand could reach my face. If she had succeeded in slapping me, I swear, I would have done something that I would have regret for years to come. She starts screaming for help, and someone starts moving in our way in an attempt to stop what's going on. But that wasn't necessary, because the little excuse for a human does something that I didn't even think kids were capable of. He punched me in the jewels. That kid was fully aware of the weak point of a male, yet he did it. Unbelievable. The pain does little except fuel the rage that was boiling in me. I must say, I am a very patient person and all, but when I lose it, I don't have any self-control, so it always ends bad, and that was going to end very bad for both me and them. I stand up from the chair and push away the woman when her and her son start demonstrating their impressive acting skills. She rolls on the floor screaming and the little jerk has the courage to fake a cry while several people were getting closer. I was confused, enraged, and shocked. I've never dealt with someone who could be so shameless. I was literally speechless and frozen in place with my fists closed, in pain from the punch I received in the jewels. While standing still, looking at the pathetic show they were giving, I feel someone grabbing my hands and handcuffing me. It was the security guard who clearly misunderstood and judged by the last scene. He then escorted me to a white room with nothing but a table and started asking me questions after I calmed down. Everything I answered to those questions was, check the camera registration and you'll see. I was frustrated and angered. I didn't want to see anything at all, but I was thankful at the guard too for removing me from that place before I could get my hands on them. Something like 20 minutes passes and the guard comes back and hands me a bottle of water. He was an understanding person after all, luckily. Guard, you can go and forgive me for the cuffs. Your suitcases are in the other room. Would you like to press charges? I didn't want that jerk's money. I just wanted to go back home without further complications, so I refused, but I had to take a final satisfaction before taking my flight. The speakers announced that my flight was ready, so before I go, I reach out to the Karen and her kid, who were near the seat that I was sitting at earlier, like nothing had happened. I grab her kid by the shoulder and say, I think this belongs to you. You need this more than I do, I say while bringing out the Nintendo. The moment I bring out the console, the little jerk's eyes became like a cat's eyes when they're in the dark, and his mother grinned in satisfaction as she thought about obtaining what she wanted. Little did she know, before handing it to him, I snapped it in two pieces, and I got a taste of their shocked faces. I dumped the broken console on the ground as I took my leave, hearing their muttering as I left. It was the worst experience of my life, and made me discover that kids can be horrible too. When I think about it, I get overwhelmed with anger and disappointment. But then I think about the sweet revenge. I still can't believe it. And when I read that there are other similar people, my feels go to whoever has to deal with these people. P.S. For those wondering if breaking the console was worth it, yes. It was very old anyway, and all the saved data was on the R4, so I had no problem breaking it. Am I the jerk for making a box of things my partner can't touch? I'm 20, female, and my partner, who's 24, male, loses everything. You hand him a $100 bill, walk away for 5 minutes, he's digging through everything trying to find it. It's kind of cute sometimes, but other times, it really gets on my nerves. Today, two things got on my nerves bad. Thing number one, I have one very specific lighter that was my parents' last gift to me before they separated. It's a refillable one with a custom case on it. I always set it in the same place after using it. This morning, I get up to smoke and it's gone. I flip our whole apartment upside down before calling him in a panic. He tells me he used it this morning but can't find it in the car and he has to get to work. If this thing is lost for good, I'm gonna freak. Thing number two, I have lupus, an early stage rheumatoid arthritis, and my meds are just gone. I know he took an allergy pill this morning and took everything out of the medicine cabinet. Now, my two most important medications and an as-needed sleeping med are nowhere to be found. I got fed up, so I ran over to the dollar store and got a box and put a few other important things in there. I sent him a picture and said, once I find my lighter and my medications, everything in this box isn't to be touched. He texted me back saying how it was humiliating that I even went and did that, that I'm overreacting and I'm being a bully to him for something he isn't doing intentionally. His best friend, whom he works with, has now also texted me saying I'm making a big deal of nothing. So Reddit, am I the jerk for setting aside a box of things that he isn't allowed to touch due to him losing incredibly important items of mine? ETA, I oversimplified my text to him in that post 
because it was actually kind of long and I don't want my post to be too long. What I actually said was as follows. Hey love, your phone is probably off, but on break, we can talk about this. I know you didn't mean to misplace my stuff, but unfortunately, this time, it's a sentimental item and medications that determine my functionality, so I feel like we have to have some kind of solution here. It's not ideal, as I like that we share most things, but this has become more serious. I ran to the dollar store and picked up this box, and I want you to know now, if it's in this box, it is incredibly important and cannot be lost, so please don't touch it unless I ask you to. Besides this, I hope you're having a lovely day obtaining that grain, and I believe my dad is bringing you lunch today. Love you! ETA 2. Since it's the most commonly asked question, I'll address it directly in the post. He's not officially diagnosed with an attention disorder, but I have higher functioning ADHD and have noticed a considerable amount of my own symptoms in his mannerisms and behaviors. I only haven't brought it up because 1. He doesn't have insurance at the moment, and 2. I try not to bring up potential diagnoses as my mom was a bit of a pill pusher with me and it feels almost like a violation of myself when I do it to other people. However, a local clinic does free mental health screenings and we will be going to get him evaluated on Saturday. Thank God they're open on Saturdays. Update. Alrighty, internet. Here's where things are sitting now, after a 20-minute phone call. As soon as I answer the phone, he's apologizing. He found the lighter in his jacket pocket, and my meds are, in fact, behind the toilet. He will be retrieving them when he gets home and has offered me a back rub. I have accepted this offer. I ask why he got defensive with me. He apologizes again and says he has just gotten to work and was already running late and the stress of being late combined with being called out just irritated him for a minute. He wanted to text back and apologize as soon as he clocked in, but cell phones aren't allowed on the floor, which I knew. His friend texted me because he has received a brief explanation as to why my partner is flustered and irritable with little to no detail. He actually thinks the box is a really good idea and suggests we have one for every room. More apologizing, and then I hear his boss call him over so he has to go. I love yous, and we hung up. It was a misunderstanding early in the morning after a stressful start. I'm fine with the result of the phone call. The pieces of the story pie fit together and we're gonna be okay. He's surprisingly not out to get me and take my stuff out of spite. Who'da thunk it? I was a literal slave at McDonald's. This story takes place smack dab in the middle of the recession a few years ago. I had just lost my job and couldn't find something else, so I applied for welfare after my savings dried up. I live in the Netherlands, so the job center will sometimes put you on a learn to work trajectory where you do unpaid internship for your unemployment check, which was below minimum wage. I was completely on board with this and expected to be placed somewhere I could really learn something. Too bad it was McDonald's. Now keep in mind, I was not paid by them. They had no investment in me working there, yet for some reason, I was treated worse than anyone there. In what ways? Well, I'll make a handy list for you. 1. No clocking out for extra breaks. While the other employees were allowed to clock out when there was nothing to do, I was kept at the counter at all times that wasn't my 20 minute lunch break. They did this because they were paying them and not me. Putting me on break would mean someone that is getting paid is sitting at the empty counter instead, and that costs money. So no clock out breaks. 2. No dreaming. One day it was really quiet, so while the others were on their clock out breaks, I was told to clean the trays. I didn't mind that much, just listening to the radio, washing some trays, just zoning out for a minute. But then I hear my manager yelling at me from the counter, OP, no daydreaming, to which I instinctively responded, this is where dreams come to die. This earned me having to come over and receive a long spiel about motivation and work ethic. Keep in mind, I wasn't being paid. 4. No coming in 30 seconds late. Yes, you read that right. I had to ride a bike to work and I ran a bit late because of headwinds and heavy rain. I managed to clock in at what I thought was still on time, but when I was called to the office to explain why I was 30 seconds late and that I should manage my time better. Some people came in a few minutes late, but they were never reprimanded because they were paid. If they come in late, they're not getting paid for that entire hour anyway, but I was free labor, so they needed me to clock in at least 15 minutes before the shift starts in case it was busy. 5. No accidents. One morning, I had left my apartment for work. To get to the street, I need to go down a flight of concrete stairs. It had been raining again and I slipped, landing on the steps with my back. I really got hurt. My father was a paramedic and he taught me to never take chances when it comes to your back and to always have it checked out immediately. After I had crawled back upstairs, I decided to call my job before having my boyfriend take me to the ER. What would your response be if an employee said they had slipped and fell on their back? Down concrete stairs. Oh no. Get well soon. That must have hurt. No. What I got was, your shift started 10 minutes ago. 
and now you're not showing up at all? Which wasn't even true. My shift started at 9.30 and I called in at 9.25, but because I was told to come in 15 minutes early, they counted that as the starting point of my shift. When I told them I was going to the ER because I was in pain, they asked, You're still showing up tomorrow, right? At that point, I was bawling because of the pain and stress, so my boyfriend took the phone from me and told them we'll let them know before hanging up. Later that day, the ER doctor said I had a bad sprain and that I did the right thing coming there. I wore a brace, but felt better fairly soon and was back to work the next day. 6. No free drinks I don't know what the deal is at other McDonald's places, but at the place I worked, staff had their own soda fountain to get drinks from. This was free, except for me. I was only allowed to take water from the fountain and was told to write down my drinks and pay them at the end of the day. To get around this, I'd only tap drinks when no one was looking and took Sprite so no one would be able to tell I didn't just take water. 7. No self-sabotage I had had it with that place. I hated my life at this point and I didn't see a way out. I couldn't quit because I'd lose my unemployment pay. So I started sabotaging myself in order to get fired instead. So I became whiny about everything and everyone. I decided to become such a drag they wouldn't even want me around for free. Why don't I get to clock out? Why do I still have to pay for soda? How come she was allowed to go to the bathroom and I'm not? Etc. When that didn't seem to do much, I decided to just slow down to a crawl. In case you don't know, every McDonald's register has a timer at the top of the screen that gives the counter people a time limit on when an order has to be delivered. So I made it my mission to get each and every order in the red. I went as slow as possible, kept asking questions when people were ordering, and just ran out the clock. I also stopped smiling, started sighing at everything the manager said, and just be hard to work with. Management was not happy, and after a while, I was finally scheduled for a performance talk. The owner went on and on about my bad attitude, how I really dropped the ball, and how I wasn't appreciating the fact they were willing to hire someone like me. For free, remember? For free. I just shrugged at everything and refused to give straight answers other than, well, you don't pay me. And then the moment came, the one I had been waiting for since day one. Those magic words I've been dreaming of. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid we'll have to let you go. Hallelujah. I was told to get my stuff and leave the premises. I was so unbelievably happy. I was being freed. Six months of slave labor had finally come to an end. I didn't even bother changing out my uniform. I threw on my jacket and practically ran out. It was the greatest feeling I've ever experienced. And for those wondering if I lost my unemployment for being fired, I did not. And only two months later, I landed a new job that actually paid me for the next two years. So yeah, there's the story. If you're ever at a McDonald's and your server isn't being the nicest, ask yourself, is this person being paid? Because they might not be. Speaking of McDonald's, what's your favorite item at McDonald's? Please let us know. I'd do anything for a McChicken right now. The Pay It Forward Chain For the past two years, I've worked part-time as a cashier at a grocery store. I've been privy to several acts of kindness in the past, but there's one instance that really stood out to me as particularly rare. I remember it had been a fairly busy day and I had already been at work for about four to five hours or so. I think it was one of those weird middle shift days because I don't remember closing the store that night. Regardless, I was in a good mood and looking forward to my break. I was scanning the items of a lady in line, making small talk and smiling and generally trying to enjoy myself while making someone's day a bit brighter. She looked to be fairly young and seemed tired but was kind and got about $15 worth of microwavable stuff. I finished bagging our groceries. All of our baggers were busy, which was nothing new, so I was trying to be efficient, and she stayed at the end of the register adjusting her purse and wallet after paying. Since she was taken care of, I started ringing up the gentleman behind her. I don't remember much about him other than the fact that he had quite a few small items and his total was about twice that of the lady before him. When he went to pay, the card reader gave him a chip error message. I directed him to try a few more times since our machines are pretty sensitive and if the card is even a little smudged, it won't read it. Oftentimes, when a person rubs the card's chip between their fingers, it will work. Try that if you ever get the error message. However, when he tried it again, this time it registered as declined. He stepped away to call his bank and I saved his order so that I could move on to the next person, but I was stopped by the lady who had yet to leave. I'll pay for him, she said, and she still looked tired, kind of done with life that kind of expression. I could see a bit of hesitation there and the guy had stepped away, so I said, are you sure? The total was about $30. Again, this was about twice what tired lady had paid for her own order. I remember that she kind of paused for a moment, but she nodded. So I recalled that saved order and she paid for his items. I bagged them up, 
stuck the receipt inside one of the bags, and moved on to the next person in line. Tired lady had just left the register when the guy came back with his card, and I got to tell him, your groceries are already paid for. The woman in front of you took care of it. I got a really weird look from this guy. He looked like I told him I was keeping a tiny man in the register to organize the change or something equally ridiculous. He looked confused. She did? I nodded. Confused guy turned and looked at the guy behind him, then back at me. Well, I guess I'll pay for him then. The dude behind him was not paying attention and had only gotten a few items, so I just sort of blinked at confused guy and was like, all right then. I finished scanning the items and confused guy stuck in his card, which was approved. Guess he got his bank stuff worked out. About this time, distracted guy realizes that I just handed him a receipt and is about to become confused guy number two. Before he can say anything, he's told, the lady ahead of me paid for mine, so I'm just passing it on. Have a nice day. I'm just sort of standing there at that point, waiting to see what would happen next. Distracted guy thanked confused guy and looked me dead in the eye and stated, well, I'm paying for hers then. This literally repeated three times down the line and only stopped because no one else entered the queue. The last woman who had her groceries paid for by the person in front of her was a mom of two kids and she was floored when the guy paid her $60 bill. She flipped when I told her she was the sixth person in a pay it forward chain and I had a great time telling my coworkers about it when I went on break. I feel like there's a lot of perceived peer pressure that is the incentive to be kind and for a few of them I certainly felt that vibe. But overall it was just people paying it forward and it was pretty cool. So thanks tired lady, I hope you had a nice day after that because you made a bigger impact than you realized. Karen loses it when I ask her to control her kid. I was talking to an old friend I haven't heard from in ages and they brought up this story so I thought I'd share it. I used to work at Dillard's so I saw my fair share of entitled behavior from our customers but this incident happened to my coworker. A customer was browsing around with her four to five year old son. He was running around knocking things off racks etc. The mother made no effort to control him until he crashed into her a couple of times. She told him to go sit in one of the chairs by the dressing rooms. The chairs were pretty nice and upholstered in a silk-like fabric. My coworker was removing garments left in the changing rooms and as she passed by the boy, she noticed he was pushing a small car, think matchbox style car, all over the back of the chair and it was shredding the fabric. She spoke to him and asked him not to do that. He responded by blowing a raspberry at her and pushed the car with even more force. She went to the mother and said, your son is destroying the chair with his little car. Could you speak to him? Which is way nicer than I would have put it. The mother stopped and stared at my coworker. They stood there just looking at each other, which my coworker described as too long and very awkward. Finally, the mother asked, So? My coworker started saying, Well, could you? And before she could finish the sentence, the single mother knocked her across the face with the hanger she was holding. So hard, it broke the hanger. My coworker just turned around and went to find our manager. She first encountered an off-duty police officer who worked security in the store and is a close friend of mine and told him what had happened. He went with her to the manager. The manager went over to the mother, listened to her rant, apologized to her for the misunderstanding and gave her a 10% discount for her troubles. My coworker was so stunned she couldn't even speak. Even the cop was just saying, what the heck just happened? The cop turned to my coworker and asked if she wanted to press charges. Before she could answer, the manager interrupted, saying that wouldn't be necessary. Meantime, all the other employees in the department are watching all this go down and I had just walked back in for my break. I see my coworker has a huge mark across her face. My coworker told the cop she did in fact want to press charges. The manager told her she couldn't do that if she wanted to keep her job. She told him that was fine. She quit. The manager was still insistent that the mother not be troubled by all this. The cop said, she could have put her eye out and I am arresting her. If you don't like it, you can take it up with my commander. The entitled mother was still acting smug until she saw the cuffs. Then she started screaming the usual nonsense. I'm gonna sue all of you. I'll have your badge. Do you know who I am? Etc. No one but the manager cared and she still went to jail. All of the other employees and customers who were watching clapped as she was being led out of the store in cuffs. The manager started in on the employees about how to correctly deal with situations like what had happened. We all looked at each other and without saying a word, we all clocked out and left. All of us. Good luck running the entire department by yourself.
We hung around our injured coworker until she was done with the police report and then took her to lunch. She said she had been planning to apply at a different store in the same mall anyway, but hadn't planned on quitting the way it happened and worried that Dillard's would give her a bad reference now. We convinced her to go to the other right then, injured face and all. She explained what happened to the manager there. She was hired on the spot and told they don't put up with crap like that. If a customer hits you, no matter who they think they are, charges will be filed and will be permanently banned from the store. I spoke to my cop friend a few days later and he said the crazy woman nearly drove him insane with her screaming and threats on the way to jail, which wasn't close. After she saw that wasn't working, she started with pleading and bribery. He said he didn't think he had ever been so glad to hand someone off to booking. All this happened ages ago, and since that day, I've never stepped foot in a Dillard's. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.